Hello everyone, if you want to create games in Unreal Engine 5, then this video is for you. In this tutorial, you will go from knowing nothing about Unreal Engine 5 to creating this game right here. The goal is to destroy all the targets before the timer hits zero. It is a first person shooter, but you can take the skills you learned here to create your dream game. We will walk through the entire programming process. And once the last target is hit, the player wins the game. In this tutorial, you will learn how to program with Unreal's visual scripting language called Blueprints, design a user interface to display game information, create custom weapons from scratch, destroy objects using chaos physics, and finally, add our game to any environment you choose. You don't need any Unreal or programming experience to follow along. Everything throughout this process will be shown step by step. It is important to know that I have another UE5 beginner tutorial that focuses on level and environment design. So if you want to learn how to create your own environment, then you can check out that video. This tutorial will mostly focus on programming. Now we are going to start with the very basics. If you already know how to navigate inside Unreal and move objects, then you can skip to the next chapter where we dive into programming with blueprints. So with all that being said, let's start creating our game. We first have to download Unreal Engine 5. You can get Unreal Engine 5 in the Epic Games Launcher. So select Unreal Engine and then select Library. Now under here, if you don't have any versions of Unreal Engine installed, you want to click on the plus icon and then select the version you want to follow along with. Now in my case, I already have the latest version of Unreal Engine 5, Unreal 5.2 installed, so I don't need to download it. And if you are watching in the future, feel free to follow along with a newer version of Unreal Engine, like Unreal Engine 5.3. Now, I could launch Unreal by pressing the launch button, or within the drop down, I can create a desktop shortcut so I can open up Unreal without having to come through the Epic Games Launcher. So now that we have that shortcut, I can just double click on it to launch Unreal Engine 5. When you open up Unreal for the first time, you will get the Unreal Project Browser. So the first tab that is selected is the Recent Projects, which will, of course, have all of your recently edited projects. Now, if this is your first time opening up Unreal, this will be left blank. Now, in our case, I want to create a brand new project from a template. So to create a project from a template, go to games. And now we get a bunch of starter games we can select from to start creating our game from. Now, in my case, I'm going to select the third person game, even though we are later going to create a first person game. I want to show off the features of Unreal within the third person character project for now. We will create a first person project in the next chapter. And right here, we get a bunch of project settings. I'm going to leave them at default for now. And for the project name, let's call this my first project. And then it's going to ask us a location that we want to save our project at. So if you want to change this location, select this file folder and navigate to the area on your computer where you want the project to be saved. Now, in my case, I decided to save it onto my desktop and click create. Now this is going to create a brand new folder on my desktop called my projects name. And if I open up this folder, you will see all the folders and assets that make up my game. Now, if I ever exit out of my game, instead of opening up my project through Unreal Engine, I can open up the folder of my project and then double click on the .u project to open it that way. This is what you will see when you open up Unreal Engine. In this chapter, we're gonna go over the basics, like how to navigate in our world and what all these different windows do. If you already know the basics, then feel free to skip ahead to the next chapter where we cover blueprints. For those who don't know, or if you just want a refresher, in the middle here, we have the viewports. So the viewport is where we're going to be doing the majority of our environment work. Now, in order to navigate around in our viewport, you want to hold down the right mouse button. So holding down the right mouse button will allow us to pan my camera around while I move the mouse. And with the right mouse button held down, I can use W to go forward, S to go backwards, A to go to the left, and D to go to the right. So that's right mouse button held down WASD to move around. And with the right mouse button, of course, I can use E to go up or Q to go down. So that's WASD, Q and E. And if you're familiar with first person video game, then luckily for you, you already have the muscle memory to navigate in Unreal Engine. Now, let's say if you don't like the speed of your camera, maybe you think it's too fast or it's too slow. You could change the speed of your camera by coming up here to this camera icon, selecting it, and then you could bring it down to make the camera slower, or you could bring it up so we can make it something like 3.2 to make the camera faster. And the shortcut to control the camera speed is to hold down the right mouse button 
and scroll wheel. So scroll wheel up to make the camera fast or scroll wheel down to make it slower. Now that we know how to navigate inside of our world, it's time to go over how we can move 3D objects. So first, before we move an object, we have to select one. So to select an object, hover over it and left click. So that's left click to select any object in my world. And with the object selected and the movement mode selected up here, I get access to this little gizmo. If I hover over my mouse, over any of the arrows, I'm able to move it in that axis. So if I hold down left mouse button, I can move this out like that and hold it down on the Y axis to move it in the Y axis. Now you notice by default that there's a little bit of snapping going on, and that's because Unreal automatically turns on Snap to Grid. To disable Snap to Grid, I could come up here to this button and uncheck it to make sure it's no longer highlighted. Now our object will move smoothly. We are not snapping a grid. Or if I want to say snap to something large like 100, I can select 100 right there and turn on snap it again. And now my box will snap every 100 centimeters, which is one meter. I don't want to snap to the grid, so I will just disable it. Now to rotate an object, instead of selecting movement, I select rotation. So now I can rotate it on the different axes. And you notice that it is snapping by default. We can disable it just like with movement by unchecking that button. So now we get smooth rotation. And if we ever want to undo an Unreal Engine, you can always press Control and Z to undo that. And finally, of course, we have scaling. So now I'm able to scale on the Z axis or scale on any of the axes individually. You'll also notice that snapping is enabled for scaling, so I can disable that right there. So all the snap tools are up here in the top right. Now that I get smooth scaling, if I want to scale in all three axes, then I can hover over the white box in the middle to scale it uniformly. Or I can scale it just in two axes. So let's say if I don't want to scale it on the x-axis, I only want to scale it on the z and y, then I can hover in between the two over the little line, and then now I'm scaling on the two axes. Likewise, if I go back to movement mode, if I only want to move it in the Y and the X axis, then hover over the square in between the two arrows, and then I'm only moving it in those two axes. And finally, a shortcut to move in between the different translation modes is to press W to get movement, E to get rotation, and R to scale. So that is W, E, and R. And if you don't like an object in your world, you can always press the delete key or even press the backspace key to get rid of that object. Before we go over how to add objects to the environment, let's go over the different view modes. So you probably noticed by now that there is a grid. And in my opinion, I think this grid in Unreal is pretty annoying. If you don't wanna see your grid, then you come up to show and uncheck grid right there to get rid of it. Also, you'll see that we have all these little editor widgets that are around my world. Of course, when my player actually plays the game, they will not see these widgets. These widgets are just here to help us, the developer, while making our game. If we don't want to see these widgets and see exactly what the player will see in game, then I can press the G key to go into game view mode. So that is very important, and this is probably one of the shortcuts you will use the most, and that is G to toggle on and off game view mode. So throughout this entire tutorial, you'll see me select an icon and then immediately press G if I don't need it anymore. So generally when I am working, the only time I toggle off game view mode is when I'm trying to select an icon like the sun, make a change, and then press G to hide it again. And up here we have the different view modes right next to show. Here we will change what us the developers will see. For example, I can select wireframe to see all the polygon and edges that make up my world, or I can select unlit to see what the world will look like without lighting, which is helpful. Let's say if we have a really dark environment and we can't see where our object is, I could just switch to unlit. And we have lighting only, which as the name suggests, will only show the lighting of the environments. So this is what my world looks like without any materials. But for now, I'm just going to leave it on lit. And finally, let's say if you only want to see your viewport, you don't want any of these other windows, then you can press these buttons. And down here, select immersive mode, or the shortcut is F11 right there. And you could even toggle on and off game view mode right here. So if I press immersive mode, or F11, we get a full screen version of my viewport, so I can only focus on my level. And then when I'm done, I could come up here and press that button again, or I can press F11 
on my keyboard to exit full screen mode. Now you're probably wondering, how do I add objects into my viewport? Well, you could come up here to the add button and hover over any of these objects. For example, I can drag in a sphere and then scale it up. Or I could come up to the add button and add in a brand new light, like a rectangle light to go ahead and light up this corner. And you notice that when I did drag it in, we didn't see that widget. And that's because I needed to toggle off game view mode with G in order to see it. Now that I know that I have my light selected, I can rotate this to go ahead and illuminate that corner. I will delete both of those because that was just an example. If we want to add custom assets that are a part of a project into the world, then instead of coming up to the add button, we will come down here to the content drawer, which will show our content browser. The content browser is important because it contains all the assets that make up my game. Any changes we make, any programs or coding that we create will be stored here within the content browser. And you navigate this similar to how you navigate your folder structure on your desktop. So let's say I wanna see the programming behind my character, then I'll select third person, and then I'll select the blueprints, and here I get access to my character. I can double click to open that up, which will open up the blueprints on my character, and we will go over this within the next chapter. And if I wanna get rid of this window, I can click on X, or I can drag this into my environment. So let me go ahead and hover over the top here to bring down my content drawer, and then I can drag out that object into my world. Press the backspace key to delete it because that was just an example. Now the shortcut to gain the content drawer, that's how we don't have to come down here to the bottom left hand corner and select this button all the time is control and space. So whenever I want something, I can press control and space to open up the content drawer. And if I wanna search my entire content drawer, for example, let's get these boxes right here. Then I can select on content, go to search and type in cube and that will filter for all the different cubes. And we have two cubes. I want the blue cube so I can drag it into my world like this. And here's a shortcut. Let's say if we want to know where a selected item is located within my content drawer, because as you can guess, if you are going to create a larger game, you can have thousands of assets contained in hundreds of different folders and subfolders. So it could be pretty confusing when you're, for example, just trying to find out where this ramp is located within the content drawer. Well, the shortcut is control and B to jump to that location. So by pressing control and B, it automatically jumped to content level prototyping and the meshes folder. So if you just select any object like the box, press control and B that will jump to its location within the content browser because our content browser is essential to our project. You'll be opening it up a lot. I would say the most common shortcuts within Unreal Engine 5 our control space to get the content browser and the G key to hide and unhide our widgets. Okay, so we're gonna cover more of the content browser later, but before we move on to programming, let's go over our user interface and what exactly all these windows here do. To the bottom right of my screen, by default, we have the details panel. The details panel, as you can guess, will have all the details and properties of the object we currently have selected. So if I select this wall, then we get the details of the wall. Or if I select this cube, we get its details. And I can come into the details panel, depending on what object we have selected and change some properties. For example, let's say if I don't like the height of my cube, then instead of scaling it with the R key, I can instead go into scale right here and within the Z axis, manually change it to two, which will make it twice as large as beforehand. And above the details panel, by default, we have the outliner. The outliner contains a list of all the objects that make up my world. So if I hover in between the two windows, I can make the outliner bigger. So that's how we can better see it. And already you'll notice that every single object right here is within my world. Let's say if I want to grab SM underscore cube 13, I could select that. And now let's see, okay, I have this object right here selected. And you'll notice that whenever I do select an object, for example, the blocks right here, this selection will be reflected within the world. Or if I select an object within the viewports, the object's name will be selected in the outliner and the details panel will change to that object. Also, if I want to hide an object, for example, what if this cube is in my way, then within the details panel, I can hover over 
the eye icon to hide it. And then I can select the eye icon again to unhide it. Now the shortcut for hiding and unhiding objects is H. So I can select this, press H to hide it, and then press Control H to unhide it. And here's a good tip. Let's say if our camera speed is really strong by holding down the right mouse button and scrolling up and we just fly away and now we lost our world. We have no idea where it is. Well, I could come into the outliner, select any of these meshes, for example, this cube and press F to focus to it. So that will snap me to the location of my object. So I can select any location, press F and I'll snap to it and you don't like the location of the windows of my user interface, then I can hover over any of these tabs. For example, the details tab, hold down the left mouse button, and now I can drag it around. So for example, I can drag the details panel over there, or when I hold down left mouse button on a tab to drag the window around, I can drag it up here on top of another window. Now I'm able to switch in between the two tabs or I can drag it, so hold down left mouse button, and just leave it in the middle of my screen to undock it from the Unreal Editor. So maybe if I have multiple monitors, then I can have some of my windows off to the side. And if you ever want to close a window, you can click on the X icon, or you can hover over the tab and press the middle mouse button as a shortcut to remove windows. And I know sometimes this tab right here can take up a lot of valuable space that we can use to show more properties. So I can right click on that and go high tab to hide that tab. And then I can hover over that little blue triangle, select that to bring back my tab. Now let's say if I change my user interface to the point of no return, I want to get back Unreal's default user interface. Well, I can come to windows down to load layout and select default editor layout. This will restart Unreal Engine with the original window setup we had. By default, Unreal doesn't show all the windows. Sometimes if we need to change something, for example, if we wanna change the properties of my entire world, then in order to get a window that's hidden, I could come up to windows and we get access to all my different windows. A common window we're gonna use is the world settings. So if I select the world settings, it will immediately populate right here next to the details tab. And then I can switch in between details and world settings. So that's how you create windows. And finally, up here at the very top, we have our toolbar. And our toolbar is helpful because it has some buttons that we're commonly going to use. For example, we've already gone over the add tab, which allows us to quickly place Unreal's default assets like lighting or basic shapes and we have this play button. So as you can guess, if you press the play button, we are now playing our game. So since we selected the third person template, our game is just a third person character that can walk around and jump. And then if I ever want to exit my game, I can press the escape key to go back into editing mode. And another important feature of the toolbar is the selection mode up here. So I can switch my different modes. Let's say if I have a landscape, or I want to create a landscape, then I would select the landscape mode. And this gives me all my landscaping tools. Now in this beginner tutorial, we're not going to go over what these different modes are. If you want to, you can check out the other one. If you are curious, we are only going to go over blueprint programming, not the environment aspects of Unreal, which are also really powerful. Before we go, there is one last thing I want to mention, and that is how to duplicate an object. So let's say we have an object. We made some changes in the details panel. We like it and we want to duplicate it, but we don't want to have to go through the process of pressing Control and B to find where it is and then dragging in a new one and changing those properties. Instead, what we can do is press Control and D to duplicate. So Control D to duplicate an object. And now we have two objects. I can press Control D again to duplicate it. And right now it still looks like one object and that's because they're overlapping with each other. So if I just move it, you'll see that that was duplicated. Also, a shortcut to duplicate an object is to hold down Alt before you drag with the movement tool. So hold down Alt and then drag to drag out a new object. So that's Alt and drag, which is a good shortcut. And if we want to select multiple objects and move them as a group, you can hold down Shift to select multiple objects. And then to deselect these objects, you can hold down Control and left click to deselect. So now that I have these four objects selected, 
I can move them, rotate them, and scale them as a group. So press Control Z to go back. That is Shift to select multiple, Control to unselect, and holding down Alt and dragging to duplicate. Now it is finally time to start talking about programming. And when I mention programming, probably the first thing that comes to mind is someone sitting at a desk and typing out hundreds of lines of code. And while we can program games that way in Unreal Engine with the language C++, Unreal also gives us the option to use their visual scripting language called Blueprints. So instead of writing hundreds of lines of hard to read code, we can just get boxes and stream them together called nodes. Logically, they are the exact same thing as typing out code. It's just another way to visualize your program. And in my opinion, it is a lot easier and faster than C++. So a common question is, should I learn C++ or should I learn Blueprints? For most of your projects, I would stick with Blueprints, especially if you are a beginner. Blueprints can do almost everything C++ can. But even if you are going to use C++, you're going to encounter Blueprints. Since Blueprints are everywhere in Unreal Engine, one way or another, you're going to have to learn Blueprints. And that's exactly what we're going to do right now. We're going to jump straight into Blueprints. Let's open up a Blueprint, and probably the most important Blueprint right now for our game is the third person character. So the default third person character that comes with the template. I'm going to press escape to exit game mode. And then all of our blueprints are right now located within third person blueprints and BP underscore third person character. So if I double click on this, this is all the logic that makes up my third person character. And right now our window is hovering on top of our Unreal Editor. I can hold down left mouse button on the tab and then dock it up here. That's how I can quickly switch in between my main map or any of the editor windows I have open. Before we dive into blueprints, let's cover the user interface. So right now we have the event graph in the middle here. And the event graph is where we're gonna be doing the majority of our blueprint logic. And then to the left of that, we have the construction script. We will not be going over the construction script within this video because this is mostly used by artists. And then to the left of that, we have the viewport. The viewport contains all the different objects that make up my blueprints. And it's important to note that in Unreal, objects that are inside of blueprints are called components. So this camera right here is a component, and this character is also a component. And you notice that when I select on both of them, their names are being selected within the components tab right here. So this window is essentially just like our outliner for our world, but it's for our blueprint. So it contains all the components that make up this blueprint. Below that window, we have the blueprint tab. The My Blueprint tab has all the nodes and variables that are contained in my blueprints. For example, in order to get to the event graph, I could come up here and select the event graph window or under graphs, I can select event graph to jump to that location. We are going to cover more of the My Blueprint window when we start to create nodes. And of course, to the right here, we have the details panel, which allows us to edit any of the details of objects we have selected. So if I have my static mesh right there selected, then I can edit some of the details. Maybe I can even change out the mesh. So right now it's the female mesh by default. I can also go here and then select SKM underscore Manny to get the male mesh. And the controls of the blueprint viewport are the same as the level. So I can hold on right mouse button to go ahead and navigate, or I can press the F key to jump to my selected components and I can use the scroll wheel to zoom out and zoom in and hold down Alt and left mouse button to rotate. So Alt and left mouse button to rotate around an object and then use the scroll wheel to zoom in and out. And here's another tip. I can hold down the L key and the left mouse button to then rotate my sun to see what my blueprint will look like in different lighting angles. And finally up here, we have our toolbar. And the most important button up here is the play button. So I can also play my game from the blueprint and it will open up a new window with my game. So there are two ways I can play my game, press escape to exit. And all the way over here, we have the compile button. Whenever we make a change to our blueprint, like adding a new node within the event graph, in order for that change to take effect, I'm gonna to have to recompile my blueprint by pressing this button. Or I can just press play, which will automatically compile all the blueprints that my game needs. And finally, because all these panels are widgets with tabs, I can always grab them and then dock them to the side so I can customize my user interface 
And if I mess up my user interface, I want the default user interface back. Then I can always go to Windows, Load Layout, and choose the default editor layout to get that back. Now it is time to create our first person shooter. But in order to follow along with this tutorial, you have to download some custom free assets designed for this tutorial. You can download the assets, link in the description below. Now that we know how to navigate our blueprint editor, I think it's time that we jump into a brand new project because of course you probably noticed that, wait, this is a third person character. This isn't a first person shooter. And that's the game we are gonna be creating. So let's go ahead and create a new project specifically for the first person shooter. And to do so, I could come up to file and select new project up here to get the new project window, or just like beforehand, I can exit out of everything and then double click to open up Unreal Engine to also get the Unreal Project Browser. Now I could go into games and then start off our game for the first person template, but to future proof this video, that's how in the future, if they ever do change the first person template, I recommend you start from the first person template project that is included within the downloadable assets. So if you haven't already, go ahead and download the target game assets, link in the description below. Once you have that downloaded, you wanna make sure before you open up the project, you need to unzip it. Double click to open it up, and specifically, we need to unzip the first person template. So go ahead and drag that onto my desktop to unzip it. Okay, now that it's unzipped, let's go exit out of the Unreal Project Browser. We could rename this to anything. I'm gonna call this my first game, and double click to open up its folder. And I'm also gonna rename it right here because the project is still called first person template. So right click, go to rename, or shortcut is F2 and call this my first game also. So now I can double click on it. And that is how you rename projects in case you're wondering. This is what you will see when you open up the first person template. This template is very similar to Unreal's first person template, except if I press play, the gun is automatically spawned in, which will just make it easier for us when I'm demonstrating the very basics of blueprints. I can walk around with WASD, jump with space, and if I press the left mouse button, I fire my weapon, which are just firing bouncing balls. And then I can fire that into one of these boxes, which will fly away because they have physics. And press escape to exit. Now let's go ahead and let's jump into our first person character to learn more about blueprints. So press control and space, go into first person, blueprints. And right here is the character that we're using. So if I double click to go on this, this is the blueprints that make up my first person character. And here is the viewport. So as you can see, it's just a capsule collision, a camera, arms, and a weapon. And the weapon is built into the first person character. Let's go into the event graph. Now, what exactly are all these nodes? And before we jump into what these nodes are doing, the controls are right mouse button to pan. So hold down the right mouse button to pan my graph and then use the scroll wheel to zoom in or zoom out. So that's right mouse button pan, scroll wheel to zoom out or zoom in. Now we're gonna start creating nodes, string them together, change them to create our own game. And don't worry, I know this looks complicated. We are gonna create our own blueprint from scratch very soon. I just wanna have this open as an example to show what exactly blueprints are doing behind the scene. So if we zoom in very simply, these red nodes are events. So these events could be linked to other blueprints or they could be linked to the player themselves pressing buttons on the keyboard. For example, this event is telling us that it's gonna be activated whenever the player presses the left mouse button. So when they press the left mouse button, an executable wire will be shot out and then all the nodes that are connected to it will be executed in order. First, the player is gonna press the left mouse button, then an animation is gonna play we're gonna spawn a projectile bullet, which is the yellow sphere, and then we're gonna play a sound at location. So all three of these nodes make up the fire logic. Or up here, we have an action called jump, which is leaked to my space bar. So whenever I press the space bar, the player is going to jump, and then when I release the space bar, the player is going to stop jumping. And we can watch these nodes fire in real time. Now let me go move the details panel off to the side so we could see more of our blueprints. And then if I press play up here, we get our little window. Now, if I go into my game by clicking on the screen, we no longer have access to that mouse. So if I ever want to get back my mouse, 
I can press Shift and F1 at the same time. So that's Shift F1 to get my mouse cursor. So now that I have my mouse cursor and I'm no longer playing my game, I can go ahead and make the window just a little bit smaller like that and then put it up here to the top right hand corner. And I can watch my player character's nodes run in real time by coming up to no debug object selected, select the first person character to watch that blueprint's nodes. And let me make the window smaller so I can see my game. Now, if I walk around with my debug first person character selected, we can see that right there. If I press space, those nodes are running in real time. Or if I fire my weapon, you'll see the white line becomes orange, which is telling us that all the nodes connected to that event are firing. So when I press fire, Unreal will execute these three nodes in order. And that's why blueprints are amazing. It allows us to see the logic of our game running in real time. So if there are any issues and we need to debug our game, then we can watch our blueprint to see what's wrong and it helps us get a better sense of what is happening behind the scenes of Unreal. Now let's go ahead and create an event and a node connected to it. So to create an event or any nodes, you just wanna right click anywhere in the screen. So right click in an empty location, and then we're gonna create a new event, which is linked to keyboard F. So type in keyboard F and select it right there. Now, whenever I press the F key, this event will fire and anything connected to Prest will be executed. Now, to connect a node to Prest, I can drag from here and let go, and Unreal is smart enough to ask us what node we wanna connect this event to, and that is the print screen. So go ahead and select print screen right there. Now, if we wanna break a node connection, hold down Alt and left click. So that's Alt and left click to break a connection, and you can always reconnect them up like this, or you could hold down shift and click on the first pin and then click on the last pin with shift still held down to automatically connect them without dragging. So that is alt to break, shift to hook up two pins. And let's say if you do hook up a pin and then you realize, hey, wait, that's in the wrong location, then you can hold down control and drag the left mouse button out to go ahead and reconnect the pin to somewhere else. But in my case, I want to leave that at pressed, not on release. And if you ever want to duplicate a node, it's just like in our level, hover over the nodes you want to duplicate and press control D. And to delete them, press the delete key. Again, to add a node, I can delete that node right there and right click. And this gives me a list of all the nodes Unreal Engine has for us. So specifically, we want the print stream node. So I can type it in up here. Now, this is very important. Let's say if you type in the name of a node and then it doesn't come up, that's because Unreal's context sensitive is turned on. Essentially, what context sensitive is doing is that it's trying to guess exactly what node the player needs. And I say for 95% of the time, this context sensitivity does work, but there's some rare cases where it doesn't work. And you want a very specific node, then go ahead and uncheck it to get access to more possible nodes. Now, in my case, I'm generally just going to leave this on for now and type in print stream. Also, this is me personally, but instead of holding down shift to connect two pins, I like to drag from here by holding down left mouse button and connecting it up like that. So the print stream will, as you can guess, print a stream onto our viewport. So this will say something on the top left hand corner and we can have this say anything. So I'm going to do the very classic hello world exclamation point. And then we have a duration right now. It's going to last for two seconds. Let's have this hello world last for five seconds. So now if I move it right here, and that's how I can see my window and press play. Let's make this a little bit bigger. If I press the F button, that will fire. And in the top left hand corner, we will get hello world up there. So that tells us that this is working and I could just spam F and congratulations. You just created your first event in Unreal Engine. So what we're telling Unreal is that, hey, whenever the player presses F, let's go ahead and print stream hello world. But this logic is really boring. Now it's on to the fun stuff. And that is actually programming our game to create a shooter game where the player has to shoot a bunch of targets within the given time frame. But before we could do that, we first have to migrate some assets. So the assets you want to migrate 
are located within the downloadable content if you haven't already gotten that. So go ahead and double click on it. And we have the beginner game assets. So go ahead and drag that onto your desktop to unzip it. Now this is going to contain a brand new project. So double click to open up this second project and this will be the new project. It's a completely blank project, except it contains some assets we want. So it has the sci-fi weapons. If I double click on it, you can see what this is. And it's a weapon that we're gonna give the player. And of course we have the target meshes. Now, the reason why I didn't include this within the template is because it's essential to know how we can move assets in between two different projects. So I wanna bring these folders into my first game. And to do that, we first need to know the location of my first game. So where is this project located? Luckily for us, we saved it on the desktop right here called my first game. So open it up, go to content, and then go ahead and copy the location of the content folder. The reason why is because we're gonna tell the other project with the assets where we wanna duplicate these assets into. So go ahead and hold down shift to select two different folders, right click, and then select migrate down here. So it's gonna ask us that we wanna migrate all these assets, click okay. Now we need to navigate to the location of the content folder of the project we're copying our assets into. And since we already have that location, I'm gonna paste it right there and then select folder. Now I no longer need this beginner game asset project, so I can go ahead and delete it right here. Okay, now within our main project, if I press control space, we have our weapons and we have the targets. Now that I have my target mesh, it is finally time to create our first blueprint class completely from scratch. To create a blueprint in Unreal Engine, let's first navigate to the folder we wanna place it in, and in my case, I wanna place it in first person blueprints. So this folder right here, and this is where I'm gonna store all my blueprint programming logic. Now right click anywhere empty within the content browser, and then select the blueprint class up here. So it's the very first one, which means it's the most important asset in Unreal. So let's select that, and now it's gonna ask us to select what type of blueprint we wanna create. And we specifically wanna create an actor class. The reason why is because actors are anything that can be placed in my world. So let me go exit out of that. So this box is an actor. This sun is an actor. Even our sky is an actor because we're able to place it in our world. And since our target will be inside of our world, that means when we create the blueprint class, it has to be an actor. So go ahead and select that. It will ask us to create a name. I'm going to call it BP underscore target. And BP stands for blueprint. Now you don't need to name this BP underscore target. You could just call this target, but I like to start all my blueprints off with BP just as naming convention, but that's completely optional. Also, if you ever want to rename an asset, you can right click and select rename or the shortcut just like on Windows is F2 to quickly rename. Now let's double click to open up our first blueprint and immediately notice it is a blank except this little widget thing in the middle here. And that's just our scene's root. So that's the origin point of our blueprints. Now, in order to add our target mesh to this blueprint, we're gonna go to target right here, and we have that static mesh. So there are two ways to add it to the blueprint. Number one, I can simply drag it on top of that default scene root and let go. And then that will add it to my world or pressing Control Z to undo that. I can come up here and type in static mesh and select a static mesh component. And then within the mesh component right here, I can select the target in the dropdown. So in the dropdown, type in target and select it right there. So those are two ways. The shortcut is to just drag it onto the default scene root, which is easier. Now that we have our first blueprint, we can start to add logic within the event graph right here, which is completely empty except for these three events. But for now, let's compile and simply drag in that new blueprint that we created within the first person blueprint folder. So if I drag in my target, now this is the blueprint we just created. So all the logic we're gonna add right here will affect this object in my world. And because it's a blueprint, I can hold down Alt and duplicate it around my level. And one thing I also noticed that I have snapping turned on, let me go turn off snapping up there. Now here's a tip to open up blueprints. And that is, let's say if I have my BP underscore targets window closed, 
then I can always come up to my blueprints. And let's say I want to quickly edit it. I could press Control and B to find where it is within my content browser, then double click to open it up that way. Or the shortcut is to press Control and E to open up an assets editor. So you can select any asset in your world, for example, this box, press Control and E to start editing that asset. Let's add a little bit of logic to the target. And that is specifically, I wanna create an event that'll be activated whenever my projectile hits a target. So when it hits a target, I want the projectile to do something. So first let's create the event by going back into our target. And then I wanna select the static mesh. Now by selecting the static mesh, if I scroll down, we get all these events we can create. I specifically want the on component hit. So whenever something hits this target, this event will be fired. So click on the plus icon to create it. We don't need these events right now, so let me delete them. We will go over what they do later. And I'm gonna hook up a new node to this. So just double check that this is working and that is a print string. So I use print strings everywhere to debug and make sure that I'm going on the right track when programming my game. And the string will be, let's call this target hit, exclamation point, and some nodes will have advanced options. If I select this arrow, and for text color, let's make this reddish. So that's how I can actually see it because our sky is blue. It's kind of hard to see blue text in the top left hand corner. And for duration, make it five seconds, a little bit longer. So I press play. And now if I fire my weapon, boom, we'll see that the target is hitting. This event is working, but we have a glitch right now. And that is my player can come up to it, hit the target, and then it will start saying that the target is hit. So this is exactly what I don't want to happen. I only want that event to run when we fire on it. So in order to do that, move the events and drag from other actor and then type in cast to, and then the name of our bullet. So our bullet blueprint right now is called BP underscore first person projectile. So if I open this up, this is the blueprint that's being spawned whenever my character fires. So right here, I could drag from other actor and go cast to first person projectile, which is the name of my sphere bullet and hook it up like this. So casting is a whole nother lesson, but essentially what it's doing right now is that's asking, hey, is this actor that's currently hitting my static mesh, is it a first person projectile? And if it is a first person projectile, then we can execute everything that's connected to this pin. If it's not, then this pin will run. And we can see if this logic is correctly running in real time. By first, let me go ahead and let's delete those two targets. So we only have one target to make it a little bit simpler. And also let me scale it up so it's bigger. Go back into my target blueprint and press play. So now if I press fire, then target is hit. But then if I walk up to it, you'll see that the execution gets to the cast. So it gets to the blue node and then it stops because, hey, this isn't a projectile that's hitting the static mesh. It's the player character, so it's not gonna run. Only when I fire on it, will it run. Now we need a way to track how many targets are hit. So if I come into here and if we have multiple targets, I wanna be able to know how many targets have been hit. So for example, it would be two right there. And then if there's only two targets in my world, then that means the player has won the game. In order to do that, we will use a game mode. And the game mode is what you expect. It's a blueprint, but it handles a lot of the game features. So if you're playing capture the flag, then the game mode will keep track of how many flags each team has captured. But in our case, the game mode will keep track of how many targets the player has hit and the timer of the game. Press control space to go back into our first person blueprints. And the template already comes with a game mode. I wanna create one from scratch to go ahead and show how you create one. So let's right click, go to blueprint class, and select game mode base. And I'm gonna call this one GM underscore for game mode, and let's call it target game. So this will keep track of all the logic of my game. It will tell us whether or not the player won or whether or not the player lost. And if I select class defaults, we already get a bunch of details that we can set right here. So I can select what the default pawn class is. This will essentially tell us what blueprint should the player control. And right now it's set to default pawn, which is not what we want. I want to set this to BP underscore first person character like that. Now, in order to tell Unreal, hey, I want to use this game mode, we need to go back to first person map and then go into the world settings. Now, by default, we don't have the world settings. So to get it, go to Windows, 
down here to world settings, select that. And within game mode override, go ahead and select the new game mode we created, GM underscore target game like that. So now we're using GM underscore target game. Also, right now our character doesn't have a crosshair. I want there to be something in the middle screen to tell our player where they're aiming at. So let's go to HUD and then select first person HUD, which was included in the assets you migrated over. It is this first person HUD that we're using. Now, if I press play, we get a little crosshair in the middle of my screen. So as you can guess, the game mode is essential to any game you create. And this game mode will have to keep track of how many targets the player has hit. And in order to do that, we need variables. So if you've ever coded before, you know exactly what I'm talking about, but essentially variables contain data. So whenever we have something we wanna store, we store that within a variable. And to create a variable, you wanna come all the way over here and select the plus icon. Now this is gonna go ahead and create a new variable down here. And let's call this my var or my variable. And this is gonna ask us what type of variable do we want. For demonstration, let's select an integer, which is a whole number. Now you'll notice that within the details panel, we're unable to change that value. That's because I have to first press compile. And now we get access to my var. So this could be any number. This could be zero, 10, or even negative 10. We can leave it at 20 for now. And then in order to get this variable, I can drag it out into my graph, let go. And it's gonna ask us if you wanna get it or set it. I'm gonna select get for now. Also, it created two custom events by default. We are gonna recreate them, but let me delete them for now. So now that we have our variable inside of our graph, that's set to 20. Whenever I drag this out, it's gonna get the value that's currently storing, which in my case is 20. Now I'm gonna go bring back that event that we deleted called begin play. Now a begin play is very simple. This will fire once at the beginning of every game. So as soon as I play my game, this event begin play will fire. And we could see this in action right now by dragging from here and typing in print stream once again. Let's go ahead and let's see what this variable is currently holding by bringing it out to the print stream, holding it over the input and letting it go like that. So this will convert my integer into a string, which is what the print stream is asking. And let's make this text color red so I can actually see it and press compile. Now within the first person map, because within world settings, we have that game mode selected, that event begin play should fire. So if I press play, the top left hand corner, we get 20. So that tells us that everything is working and this variable is storing our values. That's how you create a value when you're starting off. What if you want to change this value during gameplay? Well, I can drag my var back into the graph. Then instead of selecting get, we select set. So this is how we override whatever value is currently within your variable. So for example, let's go event begin play. And then instead of 20, which is what it is by default, it will be, let's go negative five, right? So then we plug that up to print stream. That means when I play my game, our value is first gonna start off as 20, then immediately it's gonna set to negative five, and then that should print out negative five instead of 20. And up here we get negative five instead of 20. So that's how we change the variables of our game. So now that we know how to handle variables, Let's create a new variable that will keep track of how many targets the player has hit. So let's go ahead and hover over all those and click delete. Now I'm gonna delete that variable and click the plus icon again and call this current score. I could have renamed the previous variable because we want an integer, but in case if the variable that you create is not an integer, make sure you select it right here. Now I'm gonna drag this into my world and we're gonna get it. So we're just gonna get this current score and then drag from here and type in plus plus. So this would be increment integer. What this node will do is that it's just gonna add one to this variable and then it's gonna set it. So if this variable was three and then this ran, then the variable would be four. But we need a way for our target blueprint, so our target right here, to be able to tell the game mode, hey, I want you to execute this node. And we could do that with a custom event. So I can right click anywhere in my graph and type in custom event and click enter to get it. Now we can name this event anything because it's custom and we will call this add score and then plug it up right here. 
So now whenever this event is called, then we're going to add one to the current score. And in order to see the current score, of course, we're going to use a print string. So when you are creating a game from scratch in Unreal Engine, you will be using a lot of print strings. And I can drag from here, or I can even drag from here, but I'll just drag from the output right there. And let's make a duration of five with a text color of, once again, orange. So it's easier for us, the developers, to see and press compile. Now, of course, if I just go into my game and I start firing on my targets, nothing's gonna happen. And that's because I need to tell Unreal when we wanna call this event. So we wanna call it through the targets. That's why we created this on component hit event, because now I wanna get the game mode and add one to the score. So let's go ahead, right click anywhere and type in get game mode, which will get our world game mode. And then if I drag from here and type in the name of the custom event, which was add score, nothing is gonna come up. That's because I need to tell Unreal, hey, when you get the game mode, I want you to treat it as GM underscore target game. So we need to tell Unreal exactly what game mode are we getting. And that is cast to GM underscore target game which is the game mode we just created. And we will hook it up here like that. And also, I can delete this print string since we no longer need it. Now I can drag from GM target game and then type in add score and click enter. So now we are calling the custom event that we just created. And I could double click on this add score, which will take me to that event. Now this should work. So let me go move this off to the side, press play. If I have my first target selected, so let's go ahead and select GM underscore target game. Now, if I fire on it, you'll see that we get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And I keep on firing and that increment will increase. So that's how we know our ad score custom event is being called from our targets. Now we do have a really bad exploit players could use. And that is what I want to happen is that the player hits one target. So one point, two, and three. And since it's three out of three, that means the player wins. But right now, the player can get to a count of three by coming up to just one target and going one, two, and three. So I want it where whenever I hit an object, after I hit it again, this event right here no longer runs. And we're going to do that with a new variable, and that is a Boolean. So let's come to variables and add a brand new one within our target. And by default, it is a Boolean. We can always change that by clicking on this button and selecting Boolean. And let's rename this variable up here to is hit question mark. Since this variable is a Boolean, it stores a true and a false value. This variable will tell us whether or not this target has already been hit. If it was hit, this is true. If it hasn't been hit yet, then it will be false. So I could drag this into my graph and we will get it. Now we're going to go over one of the most essential nodes or probably the most essential node of Unreal Engine or just programming in general. And that is the if statement. So right click on the graph and type in if and in Unreal Engine, they call it a branch. So select the branch, but the branch is an if statement or hold down B and left click to create a branch. And that's how essential this node is. The fact that we have a shortcut, so B and left click to create it means it's pretty important. So I can delete those because we don't need it. And now let me go ahead and let's move all these nodes over there. And first, we're going to see whether or not this object was hit. So if this object was hit, which means if this value is true, then we don't want anything to be plugged up here. Because the object was already hit, we don't need to make another call to the at score. I only want to make a call to the at score if the object hasn't been hit yet. So if it is false, but I can't just plug it up like this because we have to set the is hit. So let me drag from this variable and select set. Now let me go and let's move these nodes right there and then hook up the is set to false and then hook it back up to the casting node. When a projectile hits our static mesh, we're gonna check, has this already been hit? If it hasn't been hit, if it's still false, then we're gonna set it to true. So that means our object has been hit, and then we make a call to the add score. So the next time it is hit, because is hit is now set to true, 
then the true statement will be ran and not the false statement. And since nothing is plugged up, that means nothing is going to happen. Now, if I play my game, walk up to a target, hit it once, it adds to the score. And then if I hit again, it doesn't add anything. I have to hit the other targets to add a score. So now we're at a score of two and three, and now we won the game. I can't just keep spamming these different targets to increase the score. So let's jump back into BP underscore target. Now, generally, and this is just aesthetics, you do not have to do this. We want to hook up the bulk of my nodes to the true pin and not the false pin. The reason why is because it just looks nicer. So it organizes our graph just a little bit better. And we could do that by checking if this is hit is a not Boolean. So type in not Boolean and then plug it in. So now we're checking if is hit is not set to true. So if it is not set to true, then we will hook it up through here and set it to true. Just like that. So all we did was add a not to go ahead and flip the executable. And here's a tip. Instead of dragging a variable into my graph and then selecting get or set, I can hold down control and drag it in to automatically get it or hold down alt and drag it in to automatically set it. So that is another nice shortcut to prevent one more click. Before we move on to the next chapter, let's briefly go over what we did. This event will run whenever our target is hit. Then we're gonna check if it was a first person projectile that hit it. And if it was, we will then check whether or not this target has already been hit. And then if it hasn't already been hit, then we're gonna set that variable to is hit to true so that these nodes won't be ran again in the future. And then we tell the game mode to add a score to our current score. And if we jump into the first person map, here's what we have. We could add one, two, and three. So our game is slowly forming, but there is one glaring issue, and that is it looks kind of ugly. Having to rely on the print string node to keep track of all of our scores looks really bad. This is where user interfaces come in handy. In Unreal, you can create a user interface using Unreal's motion graphic UI designer, which is a mouthful. So it is called UMG for short. Right now, we will create a user interface to keep track of the player's score which is how many targets are left for the player to hit. And we can create the user interface by making a widget blueprint. Before we create our user interface, don't forget to save everything because that would be very unfortunate if we lost our progress. So select save all and go to save selected. Now to create a user interface, we need to create a widget. So right click and go all the way down here to user interfaces and select widget blueprint. Now it's gonna ask us what type of widget blueprint do we wanna create? We just want to create the basic one and call this WBP for widget blueprint underscore UI because this is our main user interface that will be displayed whenever the player is playing the game. So let's double click to go inside of it. And here in the middle is where we're going to create the user interface. On the top left hand corner, we have the palette. The palette contains all the items we could display to the player. And before I drag in anything, the very first item you need to drag in is the canvas panel. So whenever you create a new widget, the first thing you need to do is add in a canvas panel and let go. So let's go ahead and let's move the details panel off to the side so we can better see it. And the controls are the exact same as the blueprints. Hold down the right mouse button to pan and use the scroll wheel to zoom out and zoom in. Now we will add in text. So I could come to comment and drag out text or I could type in text right here and drag it out like this. So now we have text that will be displayed within the game. And you'll also notice that we have this little flower icon right here. And this flower icon is anchoring. So let me go show what this is. So let me go place this at the very top left hand corner. Or I can come up to anchors within the details panel and select the top left hand corner. Now in order to change the text within details, go to text. And we can call this something. Let's call this top left. Now, all the items we add to this widget will be down here within the hierarchy. So you see, we already have text top left. If I control C, control V, we now have another top left that I'm going to drag all the way to the right over here. And within anchors, select the right hand corner. Now we're going to call this one top right. And then control C, control V again, drag this into the center. And for the anchors, select center. And this one will be called center. 
Now I'm doing this, that's how we know exactly what these anchors are doing. Now let's press compile. And I want to display this widget blueprint as soon as the game starts. So we could do that within the game mode. And we can plug it up to event begin play. As a reminder, in case you don't have it, just right click anywhere and type in event begin play. So as soon as our game starts, we will create a widget. And that widget will be the one we just made, which is WBP underscore UI. Okay, so let's compile. And if we play our game, uh oh, we do not see our widget. And that's because within the game mode, I'm creating the widget, but I'm not displaying it. So drag from the return value, which contains our widget. And now we're going to tell Unreal to add that widget to the viewport. So we will create it, add to viewport. And now if I press play, our event begin play will fire and create our widget. And we have our widget. So we have top left, top right, and center. And notice how when I change the size of my window, the center is staying in the center and the left-handed right-hand corners are staying within their corners. And that's exactly what anchors do. It's essentially like responsive design. It ensures that this piece of the user interface will always stay there in relation to the player's window because not every window will be 1080 by 1920. Some windows can be really long or maybe even someone's gaming on a one by one monitor. People's setups can be pretty weird. So I do not need the center and I did not need the top right because that was just an example. I want the top left right there and we will call this score. So this will contain the score of my game. But if I press play, honestly, this widget is a little bit too small right now. I want to make it bigger. So let's select score and within appearance, we have size. So let's make this a size of let's go 64 because that was too big. We don't want it to take up the entire screen. Actually, let's try 45. OK, that looks good. I will actually just increase that a little bit more to 50. And now that we have a score in the top left hand corner, I want that score to update whenever I hit a target. And to do that, we can add some blueprint logic within my user interface to tell the user interface exactly what score should be displayed. And we could do that within the graph. So not only do our widgets allow us to create a user interface, they also allow us to create logic right here. And I'll go select all that and delete it. Now, I specifically want to update this text right here. And I first have to name this text. So let's call this score text. The reason why is because I want a clear name. So when I'm in the graph, I'm able to grab score text and update it. But you notice that, wait, there's nothing within my blueprints. I can't update that yet. And that's because you also want to make sure that is variable is turned on. So select it and turn on as variable. Now we get access to score text right here. So I can drag from here and get the score text. And then in order to update the score text, drag from here and go set text text and select that. So now this is going to change that text to whatever is inputted right here. And to show that it is working, let's change this to hello world and then hook it up to an event begin play. But widgets don't have an event begin play. Instead, they have an event construct, which will run as soon as the widget is created. So it's essentially like an event begin play. So if I press play now, hello world is being displayed instead of score. Now, I want this to display the current number count from our game mode. So get current score. And we could do that by first deleting event construct because that was just an example and create a brand new custom event. Call this one update score and then hook it up right there. But actually, before we do, we need to first get the game mode and then do exactly what we did within the targets. And that is cast to GM underscore target game. So cast to GM underscore target game to get access to current score, all the variables and custom events that are located within our custom game mode. And then I get drag from here. So let's drag from here and go get current score and select that. Now I will drag from it, hover over hello world and let go to convert that integer into a string and hook this all up like that. 
So let's compile, save. And now, of course, if I play my game and then if I fire, that score will not be updated. That's because we need to call update score within the game mode. So as soon as we add a score, then we're going to update this widget up here. But in order to call the update score custom event, we first have to get a reference to it. So we're going to take this event and store it inside of a variable. So to do that, I can come to variables, create a brand new one and call this one user interface. Now, as for the type, instead of selecting one of these types, I will type in the name of my widget, which is WBP underscore UI, and then just select an object reference. Now I can hold down alt to set it. And then I'm going to plug up the return value right there and plug it up like this. So that's how as soon as I create my widget, we will store that widget. So now that I have access to my widget, I could come down here. So let's drag this user interface by holding down control so I can get it. And then we will call that custom event that we made called update score and select that. And luckily for us, we no longer need that ugly print screen so we could kill it and then plug up update score like that. Now, I know that was a lot to just create a variable to store my user interface. Instead, what I could do is let's delete user interface real quickly and also delete the variable. Hold on Alt to break that. Here's a shortcut. Instead of having to come down to variables and manually create it, I can right click on this output and go promote to variables. That will automatically create a variable that stores WBP underscore UI. And then we can call this one user interface, just like that and hook it up like this. And then hold on control drag and hook it back up to update score. So that's the shortcuts to quickly creating variables. You can pretty much come to any of these outputs. For example, this integer, right click and promote to a variable to quickly create one without clicking on the add button. Now, if I press play, we will update that score. So it goes to one, two and three, which is what I want. But I also want it where before we display the number, we have the word score. So it's score space, and then it displays a number. So let's go back into our widget blueprint. And we're going to do that by dragging from in text and type in append. Now, this is one of those cases where it's not showing up. So we have to uncheck context sensitive and we will append string down there. So select that. And now that's going to automatically create two different nodes. So the purple node is string, and then this string is being converted into text. Essentially, strings and text are the exact same thing. They store words. And then I can delete this two text right there. And let's go move everything over here. And this append will add two sentences together. So for sentence A, let's call this score space. And then B will be current score. So we're going to add current score to the sentence of score space, which will then be displayed in the text. Okay, so let's compile, save again. And now if I press play, we have score one, two, and three. So within the user interface, let's go back to designer, select score, and then for the text, let's make this score space zero. Now we start off with a score of zero, and then it increments as we hit different targets. One last thing I wanna do with our user interface, if we go into graph, and that is, this is pretty messy. We have to get the game mode and then we have to cast to it, get the current score. What I can do is simplify this so I can delete get game mode and the cast and the current score. And then within my custom event in the details panel, we have this input so I can pass variables through events. So let me click on the plus icon. So that's how we better understand what I'm talking about. And this input will be called current score. And we're going to ask for an integer. So now we can plug that up and it is this current score that will be plugged up right there. So if I press compile and go back to GM underscore target game, you'll see that when we call that custom event, we're able to pass data through it in our case, current score to the custom event, where then that variable can be used. So this current score will of course just be the current score output right there. So if I press play, 
now it increases without having to make a call to the game mode. Now, before we go over adding a win condition to our game mode, I wanna briefly mention how we organize graphs. Now, let's say for some reason, our current score is random as soon as we create our widget. Well, I can't within the widget just manually set the score to zero. Instead, I'm gonna to have to call the update score right here. So I will drag from the user interface and then type in update score and then hook it up. But you notice that now it is pretty messy because we have a line that's going through a node. Holy could leave it as is. There is nothing wrong with that. And our game will be completely fine. But for a sanity check for us, the developers, this is messy. So what I can do is hover over any lines and then double click to add a reroute node. So this will allow me to just move my line for organizational sake, just like this. So now my graph looks a lot nicer. And in my opinion, it's a lot more readable. Reroute nodes are amazing. You can pretty much organize your graph whatever way you may like. So let's press Control Z to undo those. And another thing we could do is hover over a set of nodes and press the C key to comment. So this is going to add in a comment and I can say add score by calling the widget, which is useful for us or other members of our team to remind us exactly what a set of nodes are doing. So I can delete that comment and we can even comment individual nodes. So if I hover over any of these nodes, we'll get this little comment icon right there. I can select it and then I can say hello world. So I can add comments to any of these nodes, which is helpful if we're doing something confusing. And then I can press that button again to get rid of that comment. And in my case, I'll just leave update score right there because we do want to start off the event begin play with a current score of zero. Always don't forget to save everything we've done so we don't lose our progress. And now let's go see our game. And we have three targets. So I hit one, two, and three. And at this point, I want to be able to tell the player that, hey, you won the game because you hit all the targets. So in order to do that, we need to go into GM underscore target game, and we have to create a brand new variable that will be our max score. So our current score is how many targets we hit so far, and our max score is how many targets we need to hit to beat the game. So let's go to variables, click on a new one, and call this one max score. And then for variable type, this will, of course, be an integer because it's just a whole number. Now we need to give ourselves the ability to somehow count how many targets are in my world. Right now there's three. And we can do that by first, let's break these notes and select them all, then move them off to the side and then drag from event begin play. And we're gonna get all actors of class. And specifically, we're gonna get all actors of class for a target. So BP underscore target. So now we get a reference to all the targets and you'll see we have this really weird out pin, which is a bunch of squares. This is an array. Don't worry, we're not going over arrays in this video, but what matters is that this stores all the different targets. And because it stores all the targets in my world, that means I can see how many targets there are by dragging from here and typing in length. So it is this output that gives me the amount of targets we need to hit. So let me move all that over and then hold down Alt, drag max score to set it. And we will set that length to the max score. So what these three nodes are doing is that it's going through my entire world, counting up all my targets, and then it is setting it to the max score variable right there. And now let's jump back into update score by double clicking on it. We need a new input variable. So click the add button. And this one will be max score, of course, of integer. And then we will add another pin and let's make this a slash. So we're going to current score slash the max score. So the player knows how many more targets they have to hit. So drag from there and add it like that. Press compile and now back in our target game, we need to fill up the max score with the max score integer. So hold out control and I could drag it into my graph and then plug it up or shortcuts holding down control, I can hover over max score and let go to automatically connect that up. So same thing right here, because right now the max score is set to zero. 
Now, if I play my game, we have a score of zero out of zero, which doesn't make any sense. So for max score, drag that right there. So press play, we have a score of zero out of three, one out of three, two, and three out of three. And then at this point, I wanna tell the player, congratulations, you won. So let's go add in that win condition whenever the current score is equal to the max score. So after we update the score, we will add a Boolean value. So hold down B and left click to bring in a branch node, or you can right click and type in if. So let's go plug this up right there and grab the current score and grab the max score. So we have a bunch of comparison notes. Now we could check if one is greater than the other, but in our case, we're gonna check if one is equal to, so equal, equal, the other. So when current score is equal to max score, that means if this is true, congratulations, the player has won. And in just a minute, we're gonna create a proper widget, but to make sure that this is working, you guessed it, we will use a print string. So let's go, congrats, you won smiley face. Okay, compile, and actually we won't be able to see this, so make sure this is red with a duration of five seconds. Also, here's a shortcut. You could press Alt and P to automatically play my game instead of selecting the play button. So that is another shortcut, is Alt and P to play the game. We hit one, two, three, top left hand corner, we get the print string, congrats, you won. Now it's time to create a widget that will stop everything in the game, stop what I'm doing, and tell the player you won. Because right now, as is with the little print string, they probably won't recognize that, hey, the game is over, stop playing. We will use the exact same process to create the windscreen as we did when creating the user interface right here. So press control space, and let's create a brand new user interface widget blueprints. And that is WBP underscore end screen, because this will handle both the windscreen and the loss screen. So let's double click to go inside of it. First thing you need to do with all widgets is add in a canvas panel. Now in Unreal Engine 4, this was added by default. I don't know why we have to manually add it now. And then we're gonna go to text and drag this in. Let's put this into the middle of the screen, make this fairly large. So let's go 60 and let's even make this bigger. And I wanna justify it in the middle of the screen. So go ahead into justification and select the middle one. Now, right now our text is looking just a little bit bland. So we can add some spice to it with a drop shadow. So first, in order to enable drop shadows, I need to go within the shadow color right here. So select this and then increase its alpha transparency. Right now it's zero, which means there's no shadow, to one, which means our shadow is full black. And then for shadow offsets, change this. That's how we can slowly bring this out to make just a little bit of an offset. Okay, there we go. And then for the text, this will be U1, exclamation point. Smiley face with a nose. Boom. Okay, we're gonna leave this as is for now, but we are going to edit it in just a second. But I wanna first display this in my world when we win the game. So of course we're gonna do that within our target game, which we will be replacing this print stream. So let's go ahead and delete that. Actually, let me go move my node set down and then drag from true, create a widget. And that widget is the end screen that we just made and then add it to viewport so the player can actually see it. Okay, press compile. Now if we go back to our game, score is zero out of three. Let's go increase that, and then we won. But there is an issue that is the player can still run around, and now this U1 screen is just stuck to my player, and we have no option to replay my game. So let's go ahead and add that option right now. To add the option to restart, we need a button. So go back into the end screen and type in a button to go ahead and get it. So let's drag in our little button. And for the anchor, of course, we're gonna set this to the center. Let me go adjust my button like this to make it bigger and then add text to my button. So drag out text and hover over and then let go. So this text will ask us if we want to restart. So restart question mark. Also, my button is way too bright. So go to style and under normal for tint, decrease this to something more darkish, like right there. 
Okay, that's better. Press compile. And now if we play our game, we have this U1, but we're still playing the game. And plus we don't get access to our mouse cursor. So we wanna stop playing the game and we wanna give the player the ability to get back their mouse cursor. Now for us, the editor, we can just press shift and one to get our mouse, but the actual player won't have that ability. But before we do that, I want it where when I press restart, then the entire world restarts. So let me go to WBP underscore end screen, select my button, and then with my button selected all the way down here, create an event for on clicked. You will notice that this is event on clicked for a button called button underscore zero. So that name doesn't really make sense. We can rename it right here to restart button. Okay, so what I wanna happen is that it reloads my current level. Right now, my current level is called first person map. So let's drag from here and go open level by object reference. And that will be this level, which is first person map. Okay, great. Now let's stop the game and show the player's mouse. So jump back to GM underscore target game. And then as soon as we win our game, we add the windscreen. We will drag from here and go set input mode UI only. So that means the player can only input actions to the user interface. And the specific user interface I want the player to interact with is the end screen. So drag from here and let go like that. Also double click to add in a reroute node. And now it's asking for the player controller. So drag from here and go get player controller. You can think of the player controller as a reference to the player itself. And then to show the mouse cursor, because the mouse cursor will not show up, drag from here and go show mouse cursor. And we're gonna set it. So we're gonna set whether or not we see the mouse cursor and set that to true so we do see it again. Okay, compile, press play, moment of truth, one, two, and three. We won and immediately we get back my mouse cursor. I didn't have to press shift one. And then if I select restart, we restart the game, but there's a glitch and that is I can't move around anymore. I need to reset the input mode to game only. So let's come up here. And then at the very beginning of my game that our input mode will be set to game by getting the player controller again. So let's grab that and then drag from here and go set input mode game only. Okay, so now we are getting the game and go ahead and re-plug it up right there. Now we do have one issue still, and that is if we beat the game with the player walking around, so let's say the player is walking towards the target, then hits it, even though we have no access, we're unable to move our player around, our player is still moving forward. So we need to completely disable movement because that is a glitch. So go into, let's go back to target game, and down here, drag from the player controller again, and let's get a set, ignore, move, input. So this will stop all the movement on my player character. Okay, now we want a new move input. So any movement that we were doing will be halted and stopped immediately once the end screen is shown. Now, if I beat my game when I'm running, so let's go fire right there and, okay, my player does stop. And then I can click restart and get back my player. And let's make the end screen a little bit nicer because right now it's kind of bland. So to do that, let me go to end screen and go back to designer. And right here, I'm gonna add a blur. So type in blur and drag in the background blur. Now I want this to take up the entirety of my canvas. So go ahead and make that really large. So it encompasses my entire canvas. And for the anchor, make sure it's set to full screen so that the blur will be everywhere, no matter the size of my game window. And then with blur selected, let's increase this to two. And then you'll notice, uh-oh, we are blurring the entire screen. That's something we don't wanna happen. And the reason why is because background blur is at the top. Now Unreal is different from other programs like Photoshop, where the last item is actually at the top. And then the top item is on the bottom. So I have to drag this. That's all right after the canvas panel, I let go, it will blur it. So now our text and the restart button are above the blur background. All right, now before we add a timer to our game, let's really briefly go over exactly what we did so far. Since this is your first time creating a game, we have done a lot. So to begin, we created the target blueprint. And the target blueprint is really simple. It's just a static mesh. And we check whether or not a projectile is hitting that mesh. 
And if it is, we're going to add a score to the game mode. And then make sure this target can't be hit again in the future with these two nodes. And then in the game mode is where the majority of my game is. And so far, our game has been pretty simple. As soon as the player starts playing my game with the event begin play, Unreal will try to find how many targets are in my world and set it as the max score. So for example, right now we have three targets. If I create a fourth one, then we're going to have a max score out of four instead of three. And then we create our user interface. Now, whenever the target is hit, we will add one to the current score. And then we'll update the user interface and check if the player has been in the game by seeing if current score is equal to the max score. And then if it is, we add the win screen to tell the player that they won, and then we stop our player's movement. So this is what we have so far. I can fire one, two, three, and then four, and we won. Right now the game is fun, but it is not challenging. The player has infinite time to hit all the targets. So let's make it challenging by adding a timer so the player will have to hit all the targets before the timer expires. And if they don't, they lose the game. That means we can either win the game or we can lose it. Before we create the timer, let's make the game a little bit harder by spreading out my targets. So let me put a target all the way over here. Put this down. Let's grab all of these and bring them all over here. Maybe one's bigger than the other. And if I want to rotate the target, I can press E, but then you'll notice that I'm unable to rotate the target in the target's direction. So when I try to rotate it, it does a weird rotation. If I want to rotate the target in its direction, then I come up here and select the sphere icon to make it a cube. Now I can properly rotate it the way I want. And just like in the blueprint, where in the viewport I can hold down L and left mouse button to rotate my sun, in my world, I can hold down Control and L to rotate my level sun. So that's Control and L held down to rotate the sun. And let's go angle it right there. But now if I play my game, our player will spawn all the way over there. Then I have to walk over here to shoot my targets. And that's because we have our player start right there. So wherever my player start is, is where the player will be spawned. So if I move this in the corner, press play, then the player will be spawned in the corner. And if your world doesn't have a player start, then when we press play, we will start from our editor camera's location. So if I press play, we just start at that location that we were at. Now to get a player start, it's very simple. Come up to that button, go to basics, and then drag out the player start. So that's how we bring one into our level. And let's angle it so it's facing the targets. And then press play. So we're spawned looking at the targets. Just in case, if you ever do want to play your game, not from the player start, but from the camera, then if I click on these three dots down here under spawn play rats, we can select camera location to spawn once again at our camera's location instead of the player start. And to switch that back, select player start. Now it is finally time to add a counter to my game so that the player has to quickly hit all the targets. If the timer expires and it hits zero, then our player has lost. So of course, we're going to add this game logic to our game mode. Now we have our add score event and all the nodes connected to it. Let me highlight everything and move it down just a little bit because we are going to be adding to the event begin play. So at the very end of the event begin play, after we create our user interface, let's add in some new functionality by dragging out here, letting go and creating a brand new node called set timer by events. So what this node will do is that any event that is hooked up to this node will run after a certain time. So if I drag from event, I can create a new custom event and call this decrease counts. I need to tell this node how many seconds until this event can run. And for now, let me leave it at one second. And to show what this is doing, let's drag from here and go print screen. And this is decrease count is activated. Okay, so now if I press play, you see that this runs and then after one second, our decrease count will be activated and then our print stream will be run. But it just stops. We want this to run every single second and not just run once. And that's where looping comes in handy. So if I turn on looping and now if I press play after one second, it runs two seconds, three, 
and so on. So every single second, this event is being activated, which is what I want because we're going to set this to 0.1 seconds. And now you see that every 0.1 seconds, it runs. So we're getting a lot of decrease counts being activated. Let's create a variable that will hold our time. So click on the add button and this one will be called time. Press compile. So we're able to change our default value and set this to something like 500. Now I want it where whenever this custom event will run, one will be subtracted from time. So I can hold down control and drag it out to get time and delete the print screen since we no longer need that. And let me go ahead and move all these nodes down to give myself more room. And we're going to do a similar thing that we did right here, where instead of incrementing current score, we will be decreasing time by giving it a minus minus. So minus minus to decrement that integer and set it. And in order to see what our time is, we will add in a print screen. As you can guess, we will add this to our user interface in just a second. So plug that up and within the advanced menu, let's make this red so I can actually see it. And it's going to decrement every 0.1 seconds. That's too slow. So it will decrement every 0.01 seconds. And now if I press play, we'll see that it goes down from 500. It continues decreasing up until we get to zero. And now it's in the negative range. So it's going to keep going down, down, down. All right. Now that I know my timer is working, let's add it to the user interface and we will do the exact same thing we did with update score. So double click to jump back to our user interface widgets within the graph and create a new custom event that will be update time and go into designer because we need to create that time text. So what I could do is drag in text like that or to keep it consistent. So it has the same font. I can select the other text, control C, control V it and place it all the way over here. So instead of having it be score, it will be time and it will be anchored to the top right hand corner. So anchor top right hand corner, we will give this a name. So we're able to tell what it is within the graph. And that is time text, go to graph and let's get the time text, drag up here and go set text, text just like that. And we're going to give it an integer input, just like with the update score. So click on the plus button, change this to an integer, and this one will be new time. All right, let me hook this up like that. And then drag from in text. And we will use the two text string. It's like that. And then once again, use the append node that we're using up here. So that's how we could append our time to a sentence. So pin that to B and the sentence will be time space. Now we need to call this event within the game mode. So let's go back to decrease count and get the user interface, which we're setting right here. So we're getting that user interface we created and we are updating the time. So the new time will be the time after it's decremented. And we also have to update the time before the set timer event. So go ahead and copy these two nodes, and then set it right here like that. And since we are getting the variable that we set right here, I could delete the user interface and then drag from here to keep it consistent because it's the same thing. And this will be set to the default time, which is right now set to 500. So go ahead and drag it onto new time like that. So if I press play, we have a timer going down from 500 all the way down to zero, and then it goes into the negative range, which is something we don't want. Also, keep in mind that you can adjust the difficulty of your game by increasing or decreasing the time. So if you want a really fast game, instead of 500, it will be 100. So now there's 100 units and then immediately goes to zero. So let's leave this at 400 and add in a loss condition. So the player will lose when this time is less than or equal to zero. So drag from time and go less than and equal. So now we are checking if this variable is less than or equal to the number right here, which is zero. That is what I want. Hold down B and left click to add in an if statement, which is asking for that Boolean. So now if this is true, then that means the player has lost, which is pretty bad. So we will drag from here and go print screen. 
all caps, you lost. Again, we will add this functionality to the end screen in just a moment, but let's see if this is working. So it starts from 400, goes down, and then it will hit zero. And now it says you lost, you lost, but we continually lose and the timer is still running. I wanted to stop at zero. So I will add in a new variable and this variable will check is game over question mark. And because it's a question mark, it will be a Boolean. So if it's true, the game is over. If it's false, then the game is still running. And since the player did lose the game, hold down Alt and drag it into my graph to set the game over to true. We no longer want to run this game. And then add in another Boolean statement. So move this all over here. And if you ever want to select multiple nodes, just like in the viewport, in case you don't know, you can hold down Shift and left click if you don't want to drag out a box. So hold down B, left click to add in a branch. And now we will check. So hold down control and drag out is game over, whether or not game over is set to false. So we want to make sure that the game is not over yet with a not Boolean. And then we decrement our timer. So let's see if this works. It goes down to zero soon. And there we go. It stops and we only get one you lost. Okay, now we're going to replace the print screen with the actual end screen. And luckily for us, we already have the logic to bring up our end screen all the way over here. So I can highlight all these nodes that make up that logic, which is creating the end screen and stopping our player's movement. Control C and Control V it over here. Now, do not worry, we are gonna go over how we can simplify this so we don't have to duplicate nodes in a moment, but let's highlight everything and plug it up right there. Now we have one big issue and that is if I press play and if the timer goes to zero, we get a U1 screen. We want to display that the player lost. So we will go into our end screen, go into the graph, and then I want to add a brand new Boolean value. So let's go ahead and let's create a new variable. And this one will be lost game question mark. So if the player did lose the game, then this Boolean will be true in the default value. Also, here's a tip. Notice how we keep on pressing compile and then we save our blueprint. What I could do is click on the three dots, go to save on compile, and then select always. So now whenever I compile a blueprint, my blueprint will automatically save for us. So we don't lose any of our progress. And speaking of saving, let's go ahead and let's save all. All right, now I want it where when this Boolean is created with the event construct, we will see whether or not we lost the game. Also, I don't like this comment right here. So I can click on the comment button to get rid of it. Now let's control and drag it into my graph to, of course, as you can guess, be left click to add in an if statement. So if we did lose the game, then I want to set this text. So let's make this a variable. That's how I get access to it within my graph and call this text end text. Go back to graph, drag from end text and go set text text. The same node we've been using for our user interface and then plug this up like that. So the new text will be you lost exclamation point brownie face. We need a way to set this Boolean value loss game within our game mode. And there are several ways we can do that. One way is to just drag out from the user interface and go set game lost and then manually set it like that. Or another way, which is a lot cleaner, is to go back to my end screen and have that variable lost game selected. And down here within the options, make sure instance edible is turned on and expose on spawn is also turned on. That will give us this little eye icon, which is now visible. So that is what this icon is doing right here. This icon will allow us to set our variable as soon as this blueprint or widget is created. Now within our target game, you don't see it yet. That's because I have to right click and select the refresh nodes. So we get this brand new option where I can set it true or set it false. Now down here, when the player wins the game, we want to make sure this is okay. It looks like this hasn't updated. So right click, click on refresh nodes. I want to make sure that when the player does win the game, this is set to false. But when the player loses the game, this is set to true. Okay, press play. Counter goes down and then it says that we lost. Very sad. If we restart the game, we won. So very happy. 
But now we have a really big glitch because our timer was still going down even though we won the game. And then it created two end screens on top of each other. So we first won the game. And then since the timer hit zero, we then lost the game. So, which obviously doesn't make any sense. You can't win and lose a video game. So that's because we need to make sure is game over. Control C this. And then Control V it right after we win the game to make sure that this timer is stopping when the player wins the game and press compile. You probably think that this graph does look messy and disorganized because we are repeating the exact same notes. We are repeating these notes and then we're repeating these notes. The only difference is this lost game is turned off right here and then it's turned on right there. So what we could do is combine these nodes into one event. That's how we don't have to repeat them. So whenever we have logic that is continually repeated, you want to add that to an event or a function. So let's go ahead and let's create a custom event. And this one will be show and screen. Now I can highlight all these nodes, press control C and control V it right there. So we will hook it up. That's how the first node is setting the is game over to true. And then the only difference is this lost game. So just like within my UI graph, we're adding inputs right here. We will also add an input to my game mode. So let's drag out the lost game, hover over this, and then let go as a shortcut. That's why I didn't have to select the custom event and manually press the plus button. Okay, now that we created an event in my graph, I can come up here and delete all those nodes and then drag from here and then go show and screen just like that. So we are calling, if I double click on it, the custom event we just created. And because we did lose the game, make sure this is set to true and then come down here and delete all those nodes. And once again, make a call to that event, show and screen and set this to false. So what we just did was that we combined all those nodes into an event. That's how we only have to show those nodes once. And they've all been condensed into its own node, which is making a call to the custom event. Now, technically, the main bulk of my game's logic is done. So if I press play, we have a timer and I have to hit all the targets before the timer runs out. Or if I don't do anything, and let's say I just barely missed the last target, then we're going to lose the game. So to recap what we did this chapter, we went into the target game and we created a timer that will run every 0.01 seconds, this event. And this event will first check if the game is already over. And then if it's not, we will decrement that time, update the user interface, and then see if that time is less than or equal to zero. And then if it is, it will call the show and screen event. If I double click, it'll just jump to it. It's right underneath all that logic. And then this will create our end screen. And we're even going to tell it whether or not we lost the game. So up here, we lost the game, which means it's set to true. And then over here, when we check if we won the game, then this is going to be left blank to tell my end screen not to override this text with the you lost text. Congratulations, you just created your first game in Unreal. But there are some additional changes we can add to make it even better. Because right now it doesn't have game feel. It doesn't feel satisfying to play our game and we want our game to be fun because why else would people play it? I want to make the gun look better and also have more of an impact when the player fires the bullet. That's why in this chapter, I will go over how to create your own custom weapon completely from scratch. So let's hop back into Unreal. Right now, the weapon is built into the first person character. So if I open up first person character by going to first person blueprints and double clicking on it, we will see in the viewport that the weapon is built in. Now, generally, at least for this case, we can leave it within the first person character because we only have one weapon. But what if we have multiple weapons that we want the player to hold? Then we wouldn't create the weapon within the blueprint. Instead, generally, we separate out the weapon into a separate blueprint. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to take this weapon and create its own blueprint class for it. So I can delete it right there and also come down to the arrow and delete it down there because that was being used by the weapon. Go into the event graph and all this logic right here handles firing. We're gonna create our own fire logic. So I can highlight all those nodes and press delete. Now, if I press compile, we are gonna get one more error and that's because in the construction script, 
we are attaching the weapon to my arms. We don't need this because we don't have a weapon anymore. So we could go ahead and delete that and press compile. Now let's go ahead and create our weapon blueprints. So control space, and I'm going to create it within my blueprints folder, right click, go to blueprint class, actor, and call this BP underscore rifle. And the reason why I chose an actor is because this rifle is going to be placed in my world. So double click to go into the rifle. And here is where we're going to be creating our weapon. So to begin, we could use Unreal's default gun, but in my opinion, I don't really think it looks nice. That's why luckily for everyone watching this video, if you downloaded the content link in the description, you'll get the sci-fi weapon. So if I double click on this weapon, this is what we're going to be using. And in my opinion, it does look a little bit nicer than Unreal's default weapon. So let's go back in a rifle, press control space and drag this onto my default scene route and then let go. So now our blueprint has that weapon static mesh, but you'll notice that we still get that little icon in the middle, which is the default scene route. We do not need that anymore. So I can hold down the left mouse button on top of my static mesh, hover it over default scene route and let go. So now the only component of my blueprint is the sniper rifle. And also this is optional. We can even drag in a scope. So let me go ahead and drag the scope up here and then let go to add in a scope. And we will place the scope right there. So this is optional. If you don't want the scope, then you don't have to add it. Okay, let's press compile. And now we created a simple rifle blueprint that I can drag into my world. But of course I don't want it just floating here. I want it to spawn with the player as soon as the game begins. So as soon as we press play, this weapon will be spawned and attached to my player's hand. And we will do that in the first person character. So let's jump back to the event graph. And up here we have event begin play, which will run as soon as my first person character is created. Right here, we're adding our inputs. And then I'm gonna drag from here. And immediately after that logic runs, we will spawn an actor from class. And of course, it's gonna ask for class. We're gonna spawn our rifle. So we are spawning the rifle blueprint, and then it's gonna ask for a spawn transform. This is asking for the location that we want this rifle to be spawned at. This doesn't really matter because we are going to attach this immediately to the arms. But for now, I can drag out my arms into my graph, and then we can get the world transform. So this will get the location of my arms in space. This is a transform instead of location, because transforms also contain rotations and scale. And if I drag from the transform, make transform, and then select it right there, we can see that transform just contains our location, rotation, and scale. So that's what that is. I can plug that up. And then I wanna make sure that this always spawns, ignoring collision. Really unfortunate if the player spawns without a gun. And then we're gonna immediately attach this gun to a component, specifically attach it to the arm component. So drag from here and go attach component to component and select the sniper rifle like that because we do not want to attach only the scope to my arms. I wanna attach the entire sniper rifle and plug it up like that. Now for the parent, we're gonna drag in arms once again and hook it up. So this is going to attach my rifle to my arms and we need a location on my arms is going to attach to and that is the grip point and make sure you spell it exactly like this because there's a point on the player's hand called grip point. And we're not going to keep relative. I want this to immediately snap to the grip points. So set this to snap to target, also snap to target and snap to target, and then press compile. So this is what our game would be if we didn't run with it. So let me break that. And our player doesn't have a gun. Now, as soon as we spawn the gun and attach it to the arms, now the player has a weapon. So that's how you add weapons. And it's great because let's say if we have multiple weapons, maybe we have a shotgun, then I could go in here and just change it out for a shotgun for the player to spawn with a different weapon. All right, so we got one big issue and that is pretty obviously, if I press the left mouse button, we don't fire the weapon. Also, if I look on the ground, the weapon shadow is showing, which I don't wanna happen. So let me go into BP underscore rifle and select my static mesh components, come up here to details and type in shadow. We do not want to cast shadow right there. 
And let's not cast shadow right there. Okay, another thing I'm gonna do, selecting the static mesh is come all the way down here to collision and set this to no collision. That's because right now our gun will block our world. So we might walk up to a wall and then the gun will block the player, which is something that obviously doesn't have to happen. So select the static mesh again and select that to no collision. So that's not blocking the player. Okay, and now we're gonna jump into the event graph. We don't need any of these events, so delete it. We're gonna create a custom event. So type in custom event, and you can probably guess what this event will do, and that is it will fire. And to make sure our fire event is working, you can probably guess what node we're gonna to do to debug, and that is the print stream. So let's go ahead and print stream that. And then we have to call this fire event within the first person character, because this is where we are going to have the left mouse click inputs. So down here, right click, type in left mouse and select the left mouse button. So when I press the left mouse button, this pin will be activated and then we want it to call the fire function. So I need a reference to the rifle we created and I could get that reference all the way up here. So right after we spawn the rifle, we need a variable that stores that rifle. So right click and go to promote to variable and call this rifle. The reason why is that a reference to this actor when it's spawned will be outputted right here. So this is where I want to store it within that variable and then plug it up. So now I can get that rifle, hold down control, left mouse button and let go to grab it. And then type in fire. And we can even see that this is a rifle because down here within the variables for type, it's selecting BB rifle. And then plug that up. So now if I press the play button, you see top left hand corner, we get hello. That's how I know the fire event is working. So I can start to add my logic now right here. All right, so we need to spawn the projectile and we're gonna do it the same way that we spawn the rifle by dragging from fire and using spawn actor from class. And we can also delete the print string since that was just there for debugging. So for the class, that will be projectile. We are gonna create our own projectile in just a second. And then we need a location to spawn this projectile. So of course, this should be spawned at the muzzle of the gun, but we need a way to indicate that, hey, it should be spawned here and it should point in this direction. And we can do that by adding a component called arrow. And keep in mind that the player will not see this arrow, so we're safe. So let me go ahead and let's rotate this, make sure snapping is turned on 90 degrees exactly, and then place the arrow at the very front of the gun. This is where the bullets will be spawned. And actually, let me go decrease the arrow size since it's a little bit too big and place it right here. Now within the event graph, I can grab my arrow and get the world transform right there and plug it up. Now the first person projectile will be spawned at the arrow. So if I press play, we should, okay. Now we're able to spawn our balls just like beforehand. But you'll see that there's no impact. It's just flying out. I want a little animation to tell the player that, hey, something is coming out of the gun. So we will do that by playing an animation on the arms. But in order to play an animation on the arms, we need a reference to the player character. So let me get player character and then cast to first person character to get access to those arms. So now that we have a reference to this blueprint, I could drag from here and get the arms components, go all the way down here and get the arms. Okay, now I can drag from arms and get the anim instance. We need this in order to play animations. And then finally drag from here. I know there's a lot to get access to the arms, but drag from here and do a play montage. So select montage play and then hook it up like that. So it's asking for an animation. This animation already comes with the Unreal's default template. So select FB underscore rifle, shoot montage, and then plug this up. So this is a lot of nodes, but that's okay. Before we press play, let's jump back into my game mode because I noticed that at least for play testing purposes, this time is too little. So let's set it to a time of 1000. Okay, press play. And now 
when I fire, you can see the weapon recoiling. Now we should add two more nodes to the fire. And that is, of course, sound. And another one is a particle effect. So every time I fire, there'll be a little bit of smoke and a muzzle flash. Okay, let's go into the rifle. And right after we spawn the actor, play sound at location. And this location will just be our rifle's location in our world. So I can drag from a location and get actor location. So this will get the rifle location. And then for a sound, we already have a sound. And that is weapon rifle punch. Now when I fire, we get some sound. And we will now spawn a particle effect. And this particle effect is a system. So go spawn system attached. The reason why we're using attached is because I want to attach this system to the arrow right here. So go back into event graph and the system is P underscore muzzle flash. This came with a downloadable content. So select it and we can view the muzzle flash by going into sci-fi weapons effects and double click muzzle flash. So here is the little muzzle flash we'll be adding to the muzzle of my gun. And the component will be the muzzle, which is arrow. So attach it like that. And we can leave everything as blank. So now when I press play and when I fire, you'll see that we get a little bit of a flash. And that flash is even affecting Lumen. So it lights up my world. At this point, we are almost done with the rifle. What we did was that we took the weapon logic that was right here within the first person character and turned that into its own blueprint. That's how if we do have multiple weapons, we can switch in between them. And if we go to the event graph, what I'm doing is that at first when the player presses fire, we get that player's arms and then we play an animation on those arms. We then, of course, spawn the projectile and then we play sound at location and add a little muzzle flash. So really for this event, we could have just gone away with one node and that is the spawn actor. We didn't have to add an animation, sound or particle effect, but then the gun felt stiff. It didn't feel like an actual gun. It didn't feel fun to fire. And the point of us making a game is to make a fun game. So even though it doesn't add any gameplay effects, it does look nicer when we fire and it could be a little bit addicting. We have one last change I wanna make. And that is the ball projectile because it doesn't feel like a bullet. It's a bouncing ball. And I don't know any guns in real life that shoot out a bouncing ball that just completely disappear after five seconds. So let's create our own projectile that is a little bit more realistic. So control space, we will go to blueprints, right click, create a new blueprint class. And this will be an actor because this projectile is in the world space. And this is BP underscore bullets double click here to go into it now we're centrally creating a bullet tracer so when the player fires a bullet they'll see a line flying by really fast so we first have to add in a collision so type in collision that's how this tracer knows when it hits something so select sphere collision right there and then for the size we want to make this really small so i found a value of two to be good so it's the smallest it could possibly be also we don't need this default scene route. So hold down the left mouse button, hover over default scene route and let go. Now we need to also add in a sphere, basic shape sphere. So this will be a static mesh sphere. And this is just floating in the air. Actually, let me go show what this looks like if we do spawn it. So go to BP underscore rifle. And instead of spawning the first person projectile, let's spawn the bullet blueprint we just created. Okay. So if I press play and spawn it, obviously that doesn't really look realistic. So we need to make that a lot smaller. Go back into the bullets and within scale, I found a value of 0.1 in the x-axis, 0.1 y and 0.1 z. Okay, so now if I spawn, you know that's a better size, but it's just floating in space. So we need to add projectile movement. And to do that is really easy. Just come up to the add button and type in projectile. So now we're able to add projectile movement to the ball. And it's asking for initial speed and a max speed. 
if we put in something like 500 and 500 for initial speed and max speed, press play. Now you can see that, okay, it's firing and it's going into the direction of my gun. And the reason why it's going into that direction is because if we go back into the rifle, we are getting the arrow's rotation. So the rotation that this arrow has is a direction of our projectile because within the world transform, if I drag from here and break, it contains the rotation. Also make sure that if your bullet scale is off, that's because it's grabbing from the arrow scale. So if I go to viewport and select the arrow, I could have scaled it up with the scale gizmo, which would actually change those values there. And it is those values, which will then be fed into the spawn actor, which the spawn actor will then use because it's getting the world transform. So to prevent that from happening, I scaled it within the arrow components. That's how it won't use that scale value. Now let's jump back into our bullet. And of course, this has to be a lot more than 500. I found a value of 13,000 to feel like a bullet. Of course, feel free to change these. Maybe you want your bullet to be faster or slower, but this is what we have now. So it just fires into the air. And this looks great, but it doesn't feel like a bullet because if you've ever seen tracers in real life, then you know that they have an emissive value to them because they light up the world. So to make our bullet emissive, we need to add an emissive material. Luckily for you, within sci-fi weapons, materials, we have M underscore emissive bullet. So if I double click to go inside of it, this is the material. It's really simple. It's just being fed a color into the emissive color. And if you want to learn how to create your own materials, you can check out the other UE5 beginner tutorial where I go over materials and environment design in depth. So let's go ahead and let's make sure that our sphere is selected and then drag this onto the material slot and let go. Now this feels, this feels like a bullet. So I can fire and everything is working great, except when I try to fire into the target, it's not working. And that's because if we jump back into my target blueprint by selecting it and pressing control E to edit it, you'll see that, uh oh, we're checking if a first person projectile is hitting it, not if a bullet is. That's a simple fix. Drag from actor and go cast to BP bullet. And then select that and delete it. Okay, so now this will work. Where if I compile, go back to first person map, press play. Now, if I hit it, you can see it is still not working. And that's because we need to make some adjustments to my bullets collision. So number one, this sphere that we have right here, I don't want that to collide with anything. That's just there to make our bullets look more aesthetic. It is this sphere. So the collision sphere, which will handle my collision. So let me press control Z to move that back into the middle. And with this sphere selected, make sure for collision presets, it is set to no collision. But for the sphere, this is set to block all. Now this should work. Now, if I hit a target, the score increases. One, two, three, four, we won the game. But you'll see that when I do hit it, the bullet just sits there. Or if I hit this, the bullet isn't being destroyed. And that just looks really weird. Maybe that's good if you're creating like a bow and arrow, but in our case, I want the bullet to be destroyed when it hits something. So this is where we're finally gonna jump into the event graph. We haven't even edited anything yet. Let's delete all those and select the sphere, scroll all the way down and on component hit. So when this does hit something, we will drag from here and it will destroy itself. So select destroy actor. Okay. So if we hit it, it just disappears like that, but I don't want it to disappear. Instead, I want it to shoot some sparks and leave a bullet hole. So within the bullet, before we destroy it, I want to spawn a system at location. So we're going to spawn another particle effect, just like how we're spawning a particle effect for the muzzle right here. And instead of spawning system attached, because we're attaching this to the muzzle, we will just spawn it at location. And this will be the other effect that's within sci-fi weapons effects. And that is P underscore projectile sparks. So go ahead and select that right there. Now it's asking for a location. 
And we could get that location by dragging from hit and typing in break. So hit contains a bunch of useful information on the component that the sphere did hit. And if I select this arrow to bring down the dropdown, we get all this information. So it looks intimidating, but we're only going to use some of it. And that is we're going to use the hit location. So drag location right there. And then we need a rotation. So in which direction are the sparks going to fly? Because if I press play now, let me come up to this wall. You'll see that it's spawning in the wrong direction. It's going to the right. I want it to spawn in the direction that the bullet hit the wall. So let's go into bullets and I can get that direction by dragging out of impact normal. So impact normal will give the hit direction and then I can hover over rotation and let go. So even though this is a normal, you could convert that into a rotation. And now this should work. So press compile. And when I hit something, okay, we can see the sparks are going in the direction of the wall. And we also, of course, we need to hook it back up to the destroy actor. Now, when I play my game and I fire my weapon, it's going to leave a bullet hole and shoot out the sparks in the direction of the wall. So we can even see all the bullet holes that we're creating. And it looks pretty nice. So if I restart the game, hit one, two, three, and four, and we won. So now our gun and our bullet feels a lot nicer than the default Unreal weapon. We do have one big issue, and if you had an eagle eye, you probably noticed it, and that is our bullet doesn't go into the direction of our crosshair. It doesn't go into the middle of the screen. Instead, it's random, or it depends on the animation of my gun. I want it where when I point at something, the bullet will go directly to where the crosshair is pointing at. So if I'm pointing into the middle of this grid and I fire, I want to go into the middle of the square, not off to the side. The reason why this is happening is because if you go back into the event graph of my rifle, we are using the rotation of my arrow, which is attached to the muzzle. That means even during animation, when the muzzle is a little bit up, then our bullet will be fired in that direction. So we get kind of like a recoil effect where the more we fire, the less accurate it is. And maybe you want that to be intentional, kind of like recoil control in CSGO. But in our case, I do want to get rid of it. Jump back into BP underscore rifle and go to the event graph. And instead of using the rotation of my arrow, we will use the rotation of the first person camera. So whatever my camera is looking at is where the bullet is going to go, which is also where the middle of the screen, my crosshair is pointing at. So go back into BP underscore rifle. And luckily for us, we already have a reference to the first person character right there. So I can drag from here and go get camera and go all the way down here to get the first person camera. Now I'm going to drag out and get world rotation. Okay, so I want to use this rotation. The only issue is I can't just plug it up right there because it's a transform. And a transform contains the location, rotation, and scale. So what I will do is drag from the transform, make transform, and then select that. So now that we have access to the location, rotation, and scale individually, I can use the first person camera's rotation. And then of course, I still want to spawn my bullet at the muzzle's location. So I can drag from arrow and go get world location right there and then plug this up. Okay, we don't need the world transform, so I could delete that. And now when I play my game, and then if I look at the middle of my grid right there, and I fire, my bullet will go into that direction. And we no longer have that issue where the more I fire, the more recoil we have. Again, if you did like that feature, then you can leave it in. But in my case, I want to make it as accurate as possible. Now that the gun feels great to fire, we need to add impact. Since when the bullet hits the target, there's nothing to tell the player that the target was hit. They have to check their score and see if the target was hit. That makes our bullet feel weak. Normally, when a fast moving object hits another object, it destroys it. So that is what we're going to do right now. We will use Chaos Physics, which is Unreal's physics engine, to destroy our target into a bunch of different pieces. Before we go over how to destroy objects, we need to cover the very basics of physics in Unreal Engine. So right now, if I drag in SM underscore target, flip this around, and if I press play, turn around, 
by default, objects are just floating in space. They have no physics. In order to tell Unreal, hey, I want to add a physics to this object, we need to go into the details panel and down here under physics, select simulate physics. Now, when I press play, that object has physics. It fell to the ground and I can kick it over and you can see it's physics flying. And here's another tip. Notice how I keep on having to play my game in order to see the physics in my world. What I can do instead of playing the game, which will possess my player character, if I still want to fly around like normal in the editor within the drop down up here, I can select simulate or the shortcut is Alt and S instead of playing my game. So now if I simulate it, then we are simulating my world. I can see the physics, but I can fly around my world and still make edits like normal. So I can move from this box down and then I can use this box to knock over that target. When I'm simulating my game, not every object can be moved. The reason why we were able to move this box was because it is set to movable. And also we set to simulate physics. As soon as I turn on simulate physics on an object, that will be set to movable. Unreal's default behavior, if I add in, let's go add in a sphere. Unreal's default behavior is to set it to static. That means throughout the duration of the game or when we're simulating our game, this object will never move. And we can even see that in action. If I press simulate, I'm unable to move this object. But as soon as I set it to movable, then I can start to move it. So I can like knock it down like that and then grab it in the X and Y axis and hit it like we're playing air hockey. So now that I know how to simulate my world and still be able to move objects to knock over different physics objects, let's go over the basics of destruction. And before we destroy an object, we first need the object that we want to destroy in our world. And in this case, it's going to be our target. Now, it's very important before we destroy objects and you want your object to be in the rotation and scale that this object will be when you're reusing it. Now, in our case, I did change the rotation. Make sure this rotation is set to 0, 0, 0 and the scale is set to 1, 1, 1. OK, now that it is. I can hop over up here to the mode selector and within the drop down, we get all these different nodes. Now we do cover landscape and foliage within the other beginner tutorial, but in this tutorial, we will go over fracturing. So this is chaos destruction. This is how you destroy objects in Unreal Engine with this mode. Now, before we can do anything, we first have to create a new destruction object by clicking on the new button. It's going to ask us, where do we want to save this destruction object? I want to save it within targets right there. And it already gave us a name, SM underscore target geometry collection. So objects that can be destroyed in Unreal Engine are called geometry collections. So let's create it. And now you'll see that this material did change. And within that folder we saved it to, we have this brand new asset. And this asset has a bunch of settings. So let me close up for now and let's go over what is happening right here. And this looks very complicated. Now, don't worry. I would say you're never really going to use any of these tools except for very specific circumstances. In my circumstance, I just want to add a basic destroy to this mesh. So I want to divide it up. And to do that, I can use any of these fracture tools right here. So maybe you want to destroy a brick wall. You would select brick. But in my case, I'm going to use the default of uniform and immediately you will start to see that we are slowly starting to break up my object, but we're not breaking up our object just yet because within the fracture tool right here, I first have to select fracture. As soon as I select this, then this mesh will be sliced up in the direction of these lines. And you can always change any of these lines. Let's say if you want a little bit more, then you can come up here and change it or you could just leave it at the default of 20 and then scroll down and select fracture. Now this will create a brand new window in the top right hand corner. And right here, you'll see that we now get 20 different individual meshes. So these meshes is what our object is going to break into when it hits something. And I can even come up here and this is just a preview. It's not going to change anything because it's under view settings. But if I increase my explode amounts, we could get a better sense of the geometry that's being created.
Now, this is the first level of destruction. We can add another level by fracturing it again. So we need to make sure that we have the root selected up here. And then I'm going to select fracture another time. So now each of those 20 pieces will be divided into even smaller pieces. And coming up here to explode, we'll get a better sense of that. So we will add another layer. So I found that three layers look good. You can honestly play with any of these values or add as many layers as you like. So let me press fracture again. And now we have three different layers of destruction. So the first layer will be the first to be destroyed. And then after that, the second layer and the third layer. Now, let me bring that back to zero. And I think we are good. So let me press cancel. And we will leave fracture mode, go back into the default of selection mode. And we have this really weird material. That's okay. Within the details panel, we can get rid of that by going into general and uncheck showbone colors to get back my original material. That material was just there to help us the developers see what the different pieces are. Okay, so now if I simulate, it falls to the ground and nothing has happened. That's because, at least for this object, it's hard to destroy it. So we could change how easy it is to destroy this object with physics by opening up the geometry collection right here within the contact browser right here. So this is where that geometry cluster is being saved that we just created. And to make it easier, I will uncheck mass density and bring up minimum mass clamp to one. So now if I press Alt and S, you can see that it was destroyed just a little bit, but in order to destroy more, I can grab this movable sphere, bring it down, and then let's smash it <laughs> like that. So it is really fun. I can basically see it be destroyed, grab it, and then slam it against the wall and see all those pieces fly everywhere. Kind of reminds me of Gary's mod. I don't want gravity to be able to destroy my target. I want it where when the player fires at the target, it will be destroyed. So let me go ahead and let's rest this target against the wall. Let's go right here. That's how it doesn't get destroyed immediately. I want to play my game again. So come up here and select the selected viewport. That's why I'm playing my game. And then when I fire on it, I want it to destroy the target. Right now it's not doing anything. To do that, we need to add a force to my bullets. So control space. Let's go back into my first person blueprints and open up the bullet blueprints. So right here, whenever it does hit a location, I want to spawn a force field in that location. And luckily for us, Unreal has already built in some force field blueprints we can use. So let's drag from here and go spawn actor from class. And specifically, the actor we're going to spawn is FS master field and select that. So this is a force field that comes with Unreal Engine, and we can even open up this blueprint to see what it's doing. So if I click on this little magnifying glass, it will jump to that location in Unreal Engine and notice how instead of it being under the content folder, it's under the engine folder. This means it's built directly into Unreal Engine. So if I double click, here is the blueprint. So it is really complicated, but luckily for us, all we need to know is that when it is created, it's going to add a force at that spawn location. So I can drag from this location and drag it all the way over to spawn transform and let go. So this will convert the location into a spawn transform. And the transform will have a rotation of 000 and a scale of one, which is what we want. Okay, so now if I compile, what is happening is that when the bullet hits something, it will spawn our particle effects and then it will spawn the force field and then destroy itself. Okay, so if I shoot it, notice how there's a little bit of a delay. It's almost like there's a one second delay before I shoot it and then it explodes. So that is by default built into the master field. It doesn't explode immediately. To make it explode immediately, drag from here and type in CE trigger. So this will just trigger it right off the bat. And then after we trigger it to make sure that the force field isn't being applied anymore because I want it to just be a burst. I will drag from return value and then destroy the actor. So it's created 
and then it's destroyed immediately. And of course, hook it up to this destroy actor, which is destroying the self, the actual bullet. Okay, so now we spawn in the master field, we trigger that field, and then we destroy the field and then destroy the bullets. Press play. If I come over here and fire, it will be destroyed immediately. And I could keep on firing at these chunks to destroy different ones. Also, I notice there's a glitch. When I look at the floor and then when I fire, my player is moving. And that's because within the bullets, the bullet is colliding with the player character, something we don't want to happen. So select the sphere and then within in the collision preset drop down, change it from block all to custom. And I want to pretty much block everything except the pawn, which is our player. So that will be ignored. Okay, now if I press play, we don't have that glitch, but we can still destroy targets and increase our score. Okay, we're gonna bring this geometry collection we created and add it to the blueprint right here. So we can select any of my target blueprints and press Control E to automatically edit them. Now within the viewport, instead of using the static mesh target, we're gonna use the geometry collection targets. That was in target right here. And also let's save everything so we don't lose that progress. Okay, so I'm going to delete that static mesh and select yes. It's giving us a warning because we are making a reference to it right here. I can delete that too. And then add a geometry collection. And within here, for the rest collision, and let me dismiss that to get rid of it. For the rest collision, drag in the geometry collision we just created and let go. So now we have it, but there is a big issue. When I press play, it just falls and they start getting destroyed. Something that shouldn't happen. So by default, within the target for the geometry collection, we will go down to simulate physics and they will not simulate physics to start with. So if I press play, they won't fall and crumble. Now jumping back into the targets, we need a new hit collision that will then activate all this logic because right now we don't have any events hooked up to it. So to get that collision, let's create a brand new one and it will be a box collision. So the bullet will have to hit this box and let me make it just a little bit smaller like that so that it's encompassing the majority of the target, like right there. And also within the geometry collection, make sure it's set to block all, just in case, so the pieces don't fall through the floor. Now with box selected, I wanna set this also to block all. So it will be blocking my bullet and select on component hit, like that. Now we're gonna hook up this event to my nodes. So when this box is hit, we're gonna see if it's a bullet. Let's double check this is working. Press play, one, two, three, and four. Okay, so this is working great. Now this is the part where we add in physics. So if this is hit, and it's the first time being hit, then we will drag out the geometry collection and we will set simulate physics to true. So now we want it where it can fall to the ground. But it won't fall to the ground because remember, as soon as a bullet hits something, then we spawn a force field. Okay, so if I hit it, it will be destroyed. So this looks really cool now with my targets. But we do have one issue, and that is, if I destroy a target and then try to walk through it, the player is getting blocked. So after that target is destroyed, we need to get rid of that box collision right here. After we set simulate physics and before we add the score, let me move it. I will drag from box and go set collision enabled and then set it to no collision. So that will allow the player to go through the targets or the bullets to also go through the targets. And we didn't have to hook it up right here. We could have also hooked it up at the end of add score. The ordering doesn't matter for this logic. So let's press play again. And now if I fire, I can go through it and it won't be blocking the bullets. And there's one last change I wanna make. If we destroy something, you'll see that, okay, the interior of my mesh doesn't have a material. It just looks really weird. And that's because we need to set a material to the interior of the mesh. 
so we don't get these plain colors. And to do that, we're gonna go into the target blueprint, go back into the viewports, and make sure we have geometry collection selected. Now, element zero will be our main material. This is the material that we can see, but element one will be the secondary material. So this is the material that's inside. And right now it's set to the wrong one. So luckily for us, if we go into the target folder, I have this other material called M underscore target interior. So this one is pretty simple. It's just a texture that will go inside of the wood. So let's drag this and place it right there. And now it is filled up. So that was a small change, but it does make a difference where if the player really inspects it, it looks more natural. And that is the very basics of how to program a game in Unreal Engine using blueprints. So now that we have a nice game, there is one more issue, and that is the environment. The world of our game is very boring. It's just the default first person map, which is a bunch of cubes. Now we are gonna go over how we can take that game that we created and migrate it over to any new environment that we choose. This part will be really fun. But before we begin, I highly recommend, if you are a complete beginner, to watch my other beginner tutorial that focuses more on level and environment design, where you will learn how to create your own environment completely from scratch. In that video, we create this environment you see on screen. If you did follow along with that tutorial, you could use that environment for your game. For example, here I took the castle forest and scattered my targets around, which will force the player to explore and see what you created. Now, if you don't want to create a world, then you could pick any environment that is available to us on the marketplace. You can go to browse and then select environments. Or Unreal comes with a bunch of free content we could use under the samples page. So here we get a bunch of environments that we could select from. In my case, I'm going to select the Electric Dreams environment because I think this looks the nicest. You can see it's a jungle. Now, keep in mind, this project is really a tense to run. So if you can't run this project, then you could pick a simpler one from the samples page. So let me go ahead and select that. And to create a project, select that. You could give it a name and a location to save it in. I'm just going to save it in my desktop and press create. It might take us a while to create this project because it is 60 gigabytes large. Keep in mind, you don't have to follow along with the Electric Dreams demo. This exact same process applies to every other environment. So now that we have it downloaded, it will be on my desktop. Just double click to open it up and then open up the U project. If this is your first time opening up the project, then it may take a while for the shaders to compile. Right here, we have the recommended specs. So you could go ahead and look at this. And if your computer is less than the minimum specs, then I wouldn't recommend running this project. But if you do have a project that's not that powerful, we have two examples. So we can either open up Electric Dreams Environment, which is the full demo, or we can do PCG Close Range, which is a lighter weight, smaller environment that's easier to run. So let's go open up PCG Close Range by going to Levels, PCG, and selecting PCG Close Range. Okay, so here is the smaller environment that you could use. Or if you have a strong computer, we can open up the main one under Levels which is electric dreams underscore EMV. And this is what we will see. And it's really intense to run. If I press control shift and H, then in the top right hand corner, I can see the frame rate. And right now we're around 30 frames per second on a 3090. So yes, this project is intense, but it is the nicest looking project in Unreal Engine. And here's a good example. We see all these editor widgets. If you want to see what the environment looks like by itself, so what the player will see, then press the G key to go into game view mode. So I'm gonna leave it in game view mode for now and press control shift and H again to get rid of the frame rate counter. So this is our environment and it is really amazing. We can even zoom all the way out and it's an entire world we can look at. So Unreal created this demo to show off PCG, which is their procedural tool framework. And there will be a tutorial and different packs in the future that go over the procedural tools. So don't forget to subscribe to check those out. Now let's go back to where we were right here. And if we want a clearer view without these windows, you can press F and 10 to hide those windows. And then if I ever want those windows back, I can hover over it and click on it to individually bring out each one, or I can press F and 10 again. So that's a shortcut to hide them. And we right now have controls for our player. That's because if I press play, it will automatically spawn us in as a drone. 
a lot of these environments come with a default game and a default player controller. So this is that controller. It is almost exactly like the Unreal Editor controls, except we get smooth movement. Now, I do not want to use this player character, of course. I want to bring in the game that we've been creating and add it into this environment. So let's press escape to get out of the game. And let's select the text because it's in the way. And to get rid of it, press the delete key. You want to open up the project where we created our game. In my case, I named it my first game. And then within here, put just control space and get the blueprint that contains all your game logic. And in our case, of course, that is under first person blueprints and it is GM underscore target game. So this is the blueprint where we made the majority of our logic. Now let's exit out and right click on it, then go to asset actions and select migrate. So Unreal will be smart enough to go through my entire project and find all the assets that this game mode is referencing. So that includes our player character. We can go up here to first person blueprints and see that our player character is being selected, our bullet, our rifle, and all the assets that these blueprints are using. So the static mesh for the rifle, the mesh for the target, and all of its materials, which is nice. So that's how we don't have to worry about, or maybe we migrate it and then we miss an asset. So let's click on OK, and then navigate to the location of your environment project. In my case, it's just on the desktop, and select the content folder, and then select it. So this will copy and paste those assets into my main environment. And right now it's using the default game of this project, and we can see what that is by going into world settings and game mode. So it's GM underscore anim sandbox. Of course, we want to change this to the game mode that we just migrated over if I press control and space, which was under first person blueprints. And it is this one right here. So GM underscore target game is what we copied over. So go back into your world settings and select GM underscore target game right there. So now if I press play, instead of getting the drone, we get the first person player character. And I can walk around and fire like normal. And also, I think my time is a little bit too short. So let's go back into my game mode and select GM underscore target game to open that up right here. And then let's change the time to something a little bit larger, like 5000. OK, so this is really fun. All this time we've been making a player character. And now we can see what our player character will feel like in an actual environment. So we can explore this environment with the weapon that we programmed. I could go around and I could just start firing a random vegetation and rocks. And I can't go over this, so I'll have to jump over that log to continue exploring. Okay, so score was zero out of zero. Of course, that's because we don't have any targets. So let me go ahead and let's set up a shooting range within this location. Also, we don't need this sphere. This sphere shows off Unreal's new material system called Substrate which there will be videos on in the future. But for now, I can delete that sphere because it is in the way and it's kind of random. So let's press control space and let's add in a target over here. Rotate this. Scale it up. Turn off snapping because that was enabled. And if I press play, I will spawn at the wrong location because the player start is right over here. So let me press the G key to go out of game view mode. And I can see that the player start is right there. I could move it over there or I can delete it and then manually come over here to place the player start down within this area. So let's go to add button basics, player start and drag that in and make sure it's rotated in the direction of my targets and then press play. Now I'm playing my game. I can destroy these targets, each one. And then we have one more all the way over there. So I'm gonna have to fire on it and we won. We don't have an issue with this environment, but sometimes the bullet will be blocked or the player will be blocked because the player collision of my world is different from what the player thinks the collision will be. So we can always see what the player collision is by going to lit and selecting player collision. Now, luckily for us in this environment, it doesn't look like that we have any collision volumes blocking my targets. So in this case, we're OK. But let's say you're in a different environment and we can shoot these targets. We have no issue. But if we try to shoot the target up here, you'll see that our bullet is being blocked. And that's because 
if we go into the player collision of this level, you'll see that the collision box is blocking the bullet from hitting the target. So in order to fix this collision, I can select that static mesh as a whole, press Control and E to open up its editor. And then if we scroll down all the way to collision, instead of selecting project default, we're gonna select use complex collision as simple. Now, if I jump back into here and go into my player collision, you'll see that our collision is the actual geometry of the mesh, which means that this shouldn't block my bullet anymore. I am able to hit that target and continue playing on like normal. Hopping back into our game environment, it is now finally time to finish our game. And honestly, this part can be really fun. We aren't even going to open up any blueprints. We're not doing anything complicated. All we're doing is that we're moving our targets around, creating new targets, and just trying to make our game as fun as possible. And also trying to adjust how challenging it is, depending on how many points we want to give the starting countdown timer. So I'm going to leave it at 5,000, but we are going to change that in just a moment. So here, what I'm going to do is let me bring this target all the way over here. And then duplicate this, hold down Alt. And here's a tip, whenever I'm moving an object around, I can hold down Shift to lock my camera to it. That's how I don't have to move it and then move my camera and move it again. I can just hold down Shift to lock it there. So let's go move this target all the way over here, then decrease its size. Add another target up here. And finally, for the very last target, Let's bring it to this little area. And you see where that kite is? Let's make a massive target, something like a ridiculous size, and then just place it here for the player to hit. And you notice that at least the way I'm setting up this level is that the targets are naturally leading the player. So the player starts here, and then they're gonna be led all the way around this rock formation. Uh, until they end up with a big target right there. So now what I'm going to do is play my game once and pay attention to how fast I can beat the game. So let's press the play button. All I'm doing right now is that I'm play testing my game to see if the game is fun and if the location of the targets does make sense. So we have one right here that I can break and notice how there is a really long stretch right here of nothing. Maybe I should add in another target there just to entertain the players so that they always have something to shoot. We shoot that one. And then we have the last target, massive, all the way up there, hit it. And then it will be destroyed slowly. It's kind of like an avalanche. And notice how we beat this with a time of 2,200 out of 5,000. So that gives me a good sense of what I can change the countdown time of my game to be. So I could change the time by selecting right there or selecting the time variable. So right now set to 5,000, we ended around 2,000. So let me try 2,500. So let's see if that would be good by going back into my map and selecting the play button. So this should be the last time we play our game. This is the final product. Now we got a race against the time. So shoot that one, that one, and this target. We have a target on this path that I could hit and I could hit the really big target right now. The fire on it and it's really cool to watch that physics it does look like an avalanche we have one target right there and finally one last target all the way over here then i fire on it and we win the game so congratulations you just created your first video game in unreal engine and we did it pretty quickly we had a time of 75 left so i think that was a good time to lead the game at congrats on creating your first game in unreal engine 5. If you got something out of it, make sure to subscribe because I have a lot of cool videos planned for this YouTube channel. I also have a new course called the Unreal Game Developer. In it, we take an even deeper dive into blueprints. You will learn everything there is about programming and game creation. We even create a full game completely from scratch. You will see the entire process from concepting a game to uploading it onto the internet. You can check it out, link in the description below. And with all that being said, I hope to see you in the next video.